Hello everyone. Can you hear us okay? I think Victoria's en route. Hello. Can everyone hear us okay? Excellent. Um, good morning everyone um, and thank you. Thank you to Yulia and thank you to the office um, in Moscow for inviting us um, to present to all of you. It's lovely to be here. Um, my name's George Heritage. I work in the Assessment Services Department in the Madrid office for Cambridge Assessment English. And my Hello, colleague. Uh, my name is Victoria and I work with George in the Assessment Services Department in the Madrid office. So we're going to give you a quick overview, an introduction to some of the digital resources um, available um, for helping teach young learners. Some of the resources can be used in the normal classroom, some are solely digital. Um, and the first bit, at least, is going to be very interactive. So we want everybody to uh, take part. I'm going to try and, use, try and show you how to use some of these resources. Some of them will be a quick look. We don't have very much time. So um, I'm going to disappear now. Hopefully that will improve the audio experience. And let's go. So, Victoria, how do we change slides? Uh... Mm, there you go. Excellent. So I think one of the best resources for young learners, which you all know, um, is, Victoria? The posters. The posters yeah. that are available for each level. I think, speaking more generally, using lots yeah. of visual input for young learners um, keeps, them, keeps them engaged, keeps them motivated. Mm -hmm. um, and we all use flashcards. Um, flashcards are nothing new. We'll have a look at some access to some flashcards later. But these posters are great. I think they're A2, aren't they? If you print them out, they can, well, I suppose you can print them mm -hmm. out any size you want, yeah. but you can download them all for free. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all very carefully constructed um, so that the vocab that is in each one is to level. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're preparing candidates for young learners, and even if you're not, because they're lovely general English exams for young learners, there are published word lists at um, each level, which are available online. If you download the Young Learners Teacher's Handbook, I think that's the most useful document. But uh, there's about 450 words at starters, 850 at movers, about 1,200 at flyers. But what's great about these posters, as I said, is they're all designed very much with the vocab to level in mind. So we're going to show you a quick activity, uh, mm -hmm. which we've done. We did a webinar when did we do it? A couple of weeks ago, which you can see mm -hmm. on our website called Write from the Start, which is really helping our young learners with writing. We're just going to take one little activity from this. This works really nicely face to face. Mm -hmm. um, did you change the slide, Victoria, or was it Julia? Um, I didn't. You Sorry, didn't. but Julia. Julia. <laughs> can, we, can we pop onto the next slide? Sorry, I can't see where. Ooh. Okay. There you go. All right, lovely. Um, I think we've gone forward one too many. Right, I've got control now. I understand it. So okay. here is a big poster which is mm -hmm. pitched at Movers. Mm -hmm. um, it's a scene that unfortunately we're not too familiar with over the last six weeks. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but a really nice activity to do face to face. You can do it with post its. So you can put up posters around the room and give your students post-its and they can run around sticking post-its on for different types of vocab. You can, I think you can easily do this online as well mm -hmm. using maybe notes on a PDF or there are some software programs where they can stick little post-its on. So how would we use this, Victoria? We're doing this to start our young learners identifying, extracting vocab. Mm -hmm. and um, writing little sentences. So how could we start vocab-wise on this, Victoria? Yeah, we can ask our students um, to, to write the words uh, for the things that they can see in the picture and that they know. So, for example, we can start by asking our participants to come up with verbs, activities, actions. Okay, what verbs can we see here? So in the bottom left... Mm -hmm. We, we have drop. drop. A rather mm -hmm. careless gentleman dropping litter yes, on the floor. Yes, not nice. Mm -hmm. Next, Victoria. Carry. We can see a little child carrying some some products from the supermarkets. Carrying a box for his mother, while she she seems a bit more laden down. Than yes. <laughs> um, but he is quite little, I suppose. Um, another one. You could have shop. Do you like mm -hmm. shopping, Victoria? 
I love shopping, yes. Do you George. prefer shopping for food or shopping for clothes? Uh, shopping for clothes. I find it very relaxing. Okay, okay, lovely. <laughs> I think they're buying a hot dog here. I don't know if hot dog is at A1. Mm. Hot, hot definitely is, and mm. dog is, but combined, I'm not so sure. Mm. So, easy. there are plenty more verbs you could pull out of this, but if we limit it to three, we'll drop, carry, shop, or shop till you drop. Do you know that expression, Victoria? <laughs> nice, we've never noticed that before. Okay, so we've got some verbs. What could we go for next? We can also get um, students to come up with uh, places, nouns for places. Okay, lovely. A shopping centre. I'm mm -hmm. not a huge fan of shopping centres personally. I, I, yeah. I, like, I like high street shopping. Yeah. And uh, being able to walk well. in between, maybe stop mm -hmm. for a coffee somewhere in between. Yeah. Where could you stop for a coffee, Victoria? A cafe, for example. Oh, in a cafe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah or a cup of tea or maybe a small yeah. beer um so we have shopping center cafe and there's one in the background which i think yeah. we're all quite familiar with at the moment mm -hmm. it's our favorite destination nowadays mm -hmm. the supermarket yeah um supermarket in the background and then i think there's one more isn't there oh yeah, yeah. very important for young learners and all learners the library when did you last yeah. go to the library victoria uh Ages ago, because I have an ebook, so, um, so you just download I don't, yeah, I don't go do to you, libraries. Do you pirate? Right. Do you pirate a lot of the things that you download? Of course not. Of George. course not. <laughs> How dare I? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Bus station. We've got lots and lots of vocab to pull out of these posters, and they're all free to download. We'll um, we'll send a, a document with all of the links that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Will be sent um, afterwards in the follow up email. Okay, so lastly, we we'll get some more nouns for food, food and drink. Yes, lovely. So mm -hmm. we'll start with cheese. One of Do my you favorites. Like cheese? Mm. I'm a huge fan of cheese. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I could survive without cheese. It'd be tricky. Um, cheese. What else do we have? We also have a cup. A cup. A cup of coffee. A cup of tea. Lovely. Um, we have hot dog, which we mentioned earlier, but we're not going to highlight that. We're going for <laughs> vegetables. Mm -hmm. And if all of your A1 movers um, candidates can pronounce and spell vegetables, you're all doing a great job. So we've pulled all of this vocab out. So we have three verbs, three places, three food and drink nouns. So now, very quickly in the chat box, we would like you, with your A1 movers hat on, to put together a sentence using these, or a couple of sentences. Try and keep it A1. Uh, a lot of the time this rapidly escalates to C2. <laughs> but uh, add a couple of simple verbs, if necessary, some prepositions maybe. Just write a couple of sentences using this vocab. In the chat box, Green grocers, yes, Katia, that might be above A1. Again, excellent if you're... Um, thank you, Daddy. Yeah. The boy is skateboarding. I like and cheese. Man. A man, man is buying a hot dog. A... Yeah. The little boy is carrying a big box for his mum. Lovely. I like cheese in this cafe. I like cheese everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to the supermarket to buy some milk. Lovely. I want to go to it. There's a library next to the shopping centre. Beautiful. Okay, so that was, I mean, we've done it very quickly with you, but you can easily get, I mean, if, you, if you're doing it face-to-face, -face, you could get a good 20 minutes out of that online. Might be a little bit tricky, it'll probably take longer online, but mm. it's a really nice way, and they're big, free, level-appropriate resources that you can download just to extract some vocab and, um, and, and get your young learners starting, at least with sentences. Um, and I think scaffolding the writing process as much mm. as possible, breaking it down into nice, manageable chunks is, mm -hmm. is, the, is the best way, especially for our young learners. But as I said, we did a whole webinar on this called The Right Criteria, which you can find on the Cambridge website, um, which takes you through everything. Then we move on from sentences to stories, and we also look at how we assess writing. So we know it's quite tricky to assess young learners writing in a fair and constructive way sometimes. So check out those posters. What else do we have for free, Victoria? Um, we also have picture books also yep. for each of the levels. 
Mm -hmm. These are lovely, lovely um, resources as well, all to level, as we're trying yeah. to find them nice and big and colourful. You can download all of these as PDFs. Mm -hmm. How could you use one of these in class, Victoria? Um, well, if we are teaching online, I would take a screenshot of some of the things that you can see in each of the picture books and then uh, get a speaking activity out of it. So get students to point out where things are, answer questions about the scene picture or about object cards that you can show them on screen and obviously encourage them to give more extended answers when yeah. possible. Mm -hmm. How many animals are there? How many people are there? How many girls yeah. are there? How many, what color is the, how many monkeys are there? Are there only two? There are normally more than two monkeys. In yeah, the maybe they are hidden somewhere. <laughs> that snake seems to be escaping. Uh, <laughs> it's not very encouraging. Uh, but then the tiger seems to escape no. as well. So, uh, um, and the tell me about questions. Tell me about is the supplementary question at the end of starters speaking. So really nice. Give them as much support as possible, as we said, guide mm -hmm. them towards different areas. What color, how many. Uh, but just to tell me about um, gives them the option to come up with whatever they feel like. It's nice for your stronger students as well. Hmm. What other activities are in the books, Victoria? Yeah, um, you can also find um, word searches and also worksheets in this case um, to practice prepositions. Um, an idea is to send them to your students so that they can reinforce the contents that you have seen during the class. Um, at home, uh, but you could also share your screen and get students to answer in the in the chat box. Lovely. We also have complete books full of classroom activities, which again mm -hmm. are all free to download as PDFs. Um, plenty of material, so please, please have a look at it. Activities like this. What's this? A mm -hmm. listening. I think it's. Um, Maybe reading. Uh, no, 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 it's not. No, it's I'm not reading, concentrating. No? <laughs> <laughs> Just to make sure you are concentrating. <laughs> yes, um, again, it's something that uh, if you share your screen, the students can see it and maybe answer in the, in the chat box for the first one and maybe the second one you can do it as a speaking activity, really. Mm -hmm. And there are also, oh, sorry, wrong button. There are also whole books full of flashcards to level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll look at another place for flash, where you can download flashcards um, in a little bit. But I think um, flashcards are are a great resource for young learners and maybe yeah. older learners, but definitely young learners. And hmm. these are all nicely designed, consistently designed, colourful, and free for you to use. Hmm. You can do matching activities with flashcards. You put this yeah. in, Victoria. Talk us through it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, know, you can use it just to practice vocabulary and as a warm up activity, but also um, as a bingo, maybe if you want to, or also uh, matching, as you said, George. So I think there there is a wide variety of, of options here to to make the most of flashcards. And Excellent. also the, the book uh, with flashcards also includes lesson plans. Yep, so ready to go lesson plans for mm -hmm. you as teachers. So, you know, you don't have to spend too much time preparing stuff. So I know things are quite hectic at the moment and we're all still getting used to teaching online and all of that and all that that entails. Mm -hmm. So this is all available on the Cambridge English website in the young learners areas. Um, there's also this website, which is um, run by Cambridge University Press um, in conjunction with us, but it's their website, a huge amount of material here. Lots of stuff um, related to the Cambridge University Press course books, uh, Fun for Story Fun. And again, it's all very easily, intuitively ordered by starters, movers, flyers. I think it's available as an app in itself, isn't it, Victoria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So you can download it from the App Store. There are also apps within it that you can mm. further download. Um, the flashcards on here are great. Um, I can't remember. I was speaking to Anne Robinson, who's one of our one of our young learners' authors. She says the flashcards here are great, and you can download them as individual files rather than. I mean, a disadvantage of the book that we saw earlier. So yeah, it's a whole set. Mm. Exactly, you get sets. Whereas here, you can download them individually and use them very quickly and easily. 
in class. You can mm -hmm. see there flashcards for A1 part one. Um, there's also a lot more, well, a big variety of materials on here. So um, other webinars um, by colleagues of ours like Karen Saxby on storytelling, mm -hmm. um, adapted stories, ready to go lesson plans. I'm not sure how you would manage drama in the classroom at the moment uh, <laughs> well it could be very interesting <laughs> and i suppose i know i mean film i mean uh, it depends on your students but i think a lot of our students have access at least to mobile phones etc mm. so you could adapt some of these um for listening and speaking what else do we have oh yeah as i said no, some, uh, you mm -hmm. yeah uh, karen sackby on storytelling we're um, going to look at some of her material in more detail in a minute. Yeah, we'll look at some of the stuff from her website in a minute. Um, here, using stories in the primary classroom, and especially this is one adapted for um, helping primary age learners with dyslexia or other um, special educational needs. So there's a huge amount of resources and material available to support you. Mm -hmm. um, right, so as we mentioned, Karen Saxby, um, she works um, on all of the young learners' exams as a writer and also published a couple of books with Cambridge University Press, um, Story Fun, which uses stories to, um, I think the whole books are structured around six stories with activities as her coming out of those. Um, and she writes with Anne Robinson as well, um, who I think did a big webinar on the Ukraine yesterday. There's a series of other webinars um, going on from next Monday onwards, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, run by um, our colleagues at Cambridge University Press on uh, on young learners. So they'll be in the uh, follow-up email as well. But Karen Saxby has her own website, which would encourage you all to, um, to visit. One of the best resources are these, I think. I think mm -hmm. if you all know the, the, the last part of the listening at all three levels um, in young learners, they have a big black and white picture. And then there is uh, a recording. I don't know if it's a monologue. No, it's a dialogue, isn't it? Mm, it's it is a dialogue. A dialogue. Yeah. dialogue. And the candidates have to color in specific things in the picture, different colors. Mm. And Karen is also, luckily, quite a talented artist. And so she has about 20 of these, I think, free to download from her website. And you can use these, get your students to print them out or parents to print them out. Um, and practice these listening tasks online. And all children love coloring in. I love coloring in. Do you like coloring in, Victoria? Yeah, I like it yeah? as well. Yeah. I think we, we probably like coloring in because we are terrible artists. <laughs> all we have to do is make sure we stay inside the lines. Uh, <laughs> but you can ask them to color, you can ask them to draw, mm. um, you can turn it into a speaking activity very easily, ask them questions about the picture, or a follow up writing, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah, do. you can you can uh, get students to write short sentences or maybe a short story about one of the characters, uh, predict what is going to do next. So, I mean, yeah, like or you could yeah you could describe what is happening, describe what is happening now. You could ask well. them to write yeah. a story about what happened before mm. or what happens after. Huge amounts of um, possibilities with these resources. Um, what else? She also has some very nice stories, uh, carefully constructed, two-level, um, mm -hmm. with lesson plans coming out of them as well. So you can break these up, read them to your students online. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, watch her webinar. She has a huge amount of ideas about how you can use stories, storytelling, story making, um, and lots of other activities you could pull out of this. Um, ask them to predict what's going to happen. Just read the first paragraph ask them to change the story, write a different ending to the story, mm -hmm. or a fact file about penguins. Are you a fan of penguins, Victoria? Yes, they, I think they are very funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and again, for as we were talking earlier about scaffolding the writing process, what's this resource, Victoria? Um, it's an, uh, a worksheet that, that you can use to practice the uh, movers, maybe reading and writing, uh, part six, I think it is. So yeah. get students uh, to get some support when writing, so from uh, shorter uh, chunks of language to more extended um, chunks of language. So it's a step-by-step -step approach, really, to answer yeah. questions, to finish sentences, and then maybe to write their own sentences. 
Yeah, and a little bit more support than in the exam, but also more more questions than in the exam. Mm. So you have the two sentence completions, um, as you do in the exam, uh, but there are three here. Three mm. questions to answer about the picture, and then there are four, yeah, on that one there's four beginnings of sentences, so supporting them, guiding them towards um, writing the sentences themselves. And they could colour it in afterwards, because everyone loves colouring it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, is that everything from Karen? Yeah. Yes, I think it is. Um, pen friends, what is this, Victoria? It's not really that surprising considering the title, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it is a, a platform that is available um, for learners from pre-A1, so very, very young ones, to B1. So you can um, register. You need to include some of the details of your school, your, your students, uh, how many you've got, their level, and then uh, you can uh, match up with other schools um, throughout the world and get your students to exchange uh, pieces of writing, so postcards or little letters. Yeah, it's a really nice way, I think, of uh, using technology to make something that we've been doing for years easier and safer because mm -hmm. you register on the website and the schools are matched together. Well, firstly, the schools are verified by our team in Cambridge and then they're matched together Um again, by Cambridge, so it takes some of that responsibility out of your hands. And I think it's just really nice to, um, it's really nice to make, make writing a little bit more relevant and mm. real and motivated. Yeah. Um, don't you think, Victoria? Did you, ever yeah. have a pen, did you have a pen friend when you were younger? No, no, no? I didn't. No, no, no. How about you? Did you? Yeah, I had a pen friend in Germany oh. when I was 11 or 12. Mm. Um, I think I had a French pen friend, but it didn't go very far. I oh. don't think we were, uh, we were very interactive, to be honest. Mm. I'm sure David had some pen friends. Our colleague David Bradshaw, thank you, David, is in the chat box helping out with links, etc. Um, so, yeah, use pen friends. There might be a slight delay in matching up schools, but I think at the moment, considering the current situation, it's a lovely, um, a lovely resource to, as I said, get get. Link, link students up and students from you know the other side of the world hmm. and make their writing a bit more real and relevant yeah um moving on victoria more activities for children <laughs> that are available <laughs> on our website and uh, it is a good opportunity to or a good resource to get them to practice all four skills they can do it on a desktop on a tablet and the the games the activities are uh, good fun i think uh, quite easy and straightforward i mean so that students can do it on their own they don't need much support because um well as you can see uh the instructions are very clear and the feedback is quite obvious as well it is very visual visual so i think that students really like it at, at least my students them. loved it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Your, your university students Victoria. my university students as well <laughs> yes <laughs> everyone <Lovely. laughs> um sing and learn is a really nice resource as well i'm not sure it depends uh, depends what what the students' parents are up to, because maybe if they're working, this might make quite a lot of noise for them. <laughs> no, no, if they yeah. have headphones, I suppose. No. How, how does Sing and Learn work, Victoria? Well, there are some songs, uh, the lyrics are available, and there are learning activities that are connected to the topics and the vocabulary um, that um, are included in the songs. Exactly. So, um, sorry. No, Go no, no, ahead. Carry on, carry, no, carry on. No, I was just saying that, but you've, you've segued onto it very nicely. Uh, yeah, there are also recommendations uh, for working with this resource at home, so uh, but also for the classroom. And I think it's um, it is a motivating way to get students to practice the, the grammar and the vocabulary and be able to remember it. And like lots of these materials, very very well designed, very much with the exam in mind, so that mm -hmm. when they do get to the exam there's no it's well, no surprises for everyone the young learners exams as you know they're much more attractive uh, than all of our other exams yeah they're really <laughs> they cool are, they're designed to be you know good fun and we 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 want ideally we would long, want young learners to come to the exam and for it to just be like any other class mm -hmm. um, encouraging useful 
um, and fun, or as fun as taking an exam can be. <laughs> I don't right. think they, well, at least my students, they didn't feel that they were doing an exam. I yeah, think well, I had the impression that they loved the speaking, <laughs> the yeah. speaking exam. The speaking as well is really good fun. It's just a few games, really. Games, yeah. a bit of storytelling, again, nice and colourful mm -hmm. um, and sort of designed with their world in mind. Hmm. Right, what else do we have, Victoria? We've, we're all very excited about this. Yeah, another yeah. resource for, for listening. Yep. This will uh, this will keep the parents. Um, what, what what should I say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the third or fourth time you've heard this song, it might get a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell us about it, Victor. I think has it just released in Russia? Um, yeah, maybe. I, I think it was I just mean... launched in Russia yesterday. I think. Okay. But you can watch okay. it. You can watch it from anywhere because it's mm -hmm. on. YouTube. Talk us through. Yeah, YouTube. yeah. Uh, there are two songs here. You can see the first one, the, the first one that was uh, made available, "Rain, Rain, Go Away." But there is another one, um, and there are um, worksheets that go with the with the song. Obviously, the the song. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Is a very nice one. Uh, oh, that so you're about to sing it, Victoria. If you're not no. familiar, it is. <sighs> No? no, 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 I tried, George. I, I tried to persuade Victoria to also do the dance on camera for the second one, which is called Move Your Body, but she refused. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I don't, yeah, I think it's more interesting what, what we have on the presentation, George. Yeah, okay, okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, please check out Poco mm -hmm. Um And Victoria did prepare the worksheets, so mm -hmm. you know that they're good. <laughs> Yeah, and well, the, in terms of the vocabulary, for example, for rain, rain go away, the, apart from weather, they can also practice clothes, feelings, and family vocabulary. So Colors, animal vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ellie the of elephant. Course. Ellie the elephant, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving on. What is, I, 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 I have not used this, Victoria, so you're going to have to talk us through it. Okay. okay, we are going to continue Very with invoking. animals apparently. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how we pronounce it. Evoki, maybe. Uh, it's a website. You can create your own avatar. You can design it. And then you can type your message or you can even record yourself. And then you can share uh, this recording by email. So I thought that it could be a nice activity um, to get um, to motivate your students a bit more. Maybe if you don't want to be on camera all the time, uh, the avatar can do something speaking for you giving them the instructions and they may like it as well and also even uh, for slightly older students maybe flyers and um, who are a bit shy and they don't want to be on, on camera maybe uh, they can create their own avatar and record themselves is that your avatar Victoria? Yeah. <laughs> I like the ears I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen a koala with ears like that. But yeah, it's a really nice way to get them speaking. And as Victoria says, they don't have to be on camera. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, the distraction with the avatar will hopefully um, help encourage them and motivate them, getting them speaking. Another mm -hmm. nice, another nice um, resource for that, Victoria? Yeah, um, Flipgrid, um, it's a, again, it's a website that you can use to upload videos. So, well, the idea is that you, <coughs> sorry, that you use, um, you give your students topics to discuss. So in this case, I thought like the tell me about could be a, a nice way to practice this uh, or to use this resource. So get your students to tell you about an object, a toy, something or that they you, like. you could use this in conjunction with some of the resources we looked at earlier. Definitely. Like the posters, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, all of these I think you can combine and use alongside each other. We have to hurry up, Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> this is also Victoria's. And you put together this little comic, didn't you, Victoria? Yes, it took a while, I have to admit. Yeah? <laughs> but yeah, because I wasn't very familiar with the website. But yeah, you can get your students to create their own comic and then tell the story. What happens in your story? Um, that the dog, uh, first the dog is very hungry and there is a UFO coming okay. um, then uh, the alien dog uh, meets the, the dog and says that um, he's hungry as well 
and then they decide to go to the city and get some food mm, in the end. Lovely. Mm -hmm. um, it was this your dog, Victoria? Victoria has a lovely little sausage dog called Madonna. Yeah. Did you have Madonna in mind? Yeah, of course, yeah? always. Okay. Yeah. All right, lovely. <laughs> Um, so make beliefs. CBBs, I don't know if you're familiar with this. CBBs has been around for a very long time, uh, but there's a lot of nice um, videos with supplementary learning material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are songs um, also for, for lit the little ones and very short, um, short stories that are very visual. So I think that you will be able to use them for the different levels if you if you adapt the activities and there are also as you can see um, some games that you can that you can use maybe the coloring game you give your students the instructions and they can color on the screen and that's great practice for the mm -hmm. young learners listening as yeah well. mm -hmm. Pelmanism are you a fan of Pelmanism Victoria Yes, I like it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please check all this out. And we will send it all in a follow up email, all the links mm -hmm. to these resources. Right. For the last couple of minutes, we're just going to look at some things that are available for you as mm -hmm. teachers. Um, so, the digital teacher, I don't know if anybody's heard about this. It was really, oh, I think it started it two or three years ago. Um, and there are various angles to this website. One of the most useful, if you have the time, I don't know if you do at the moment, um, there's quite a detailed survey um, asking you questions and it's structured in terms of the digital world, the digital classroom and the digital teacher. If you have time to do the survey and answer it honestly, it will then put together a tailor-made training package um, to help you develop the skills that you're not so strong with mm -hmm. um, it's a great resource please use it it's completely free um, beyond that I think probably in the current situation another really useful section is the product review section and these review lots of uh, materials and resources available online not Cambridge uh, resources um, who are they reviewed by Victoria um, experts in teaching and assessment of, of English so they they are they don't necessarily come from Cambridge yeah so independent uh, reviewers so it doesn't have any Cambridge bias mm -hmm. um, here's an example of a nice product review with lesson plans so a lot of them have lesson plans built into the reviews so good ways to use them well, well advantages disadvantages of products but then some of them also have built-in lesson plans and materials for you to take away as well mm -hmm. right i think we're coming to the end now a few yeah. finishing slides this is our um website at the moment supporting every teacher you can access all of the cambridge resources via here the qr code is there if you want but it will be sent out on the um on the document with useful links afterwards um, and within that site you can find our resources for teachers so free teaching resources there's a blog on the website supporting every teacher links to all of our old webinars and upcoming webinars it'd be lovely to see some of you at those um, exam preparation perhaps unsurprisingly as we are Cambridge Assessment English uh, <laughs> if you click on free teaching resources do we have this slide yeah, yeah. our colleagues over the last month have been very rapidly putting together online um, lesson plans at each level. I know that there are a few for young learners, quite a lot for A2, B1. B2 are just arriving now and C1 are en route. So um, these are all step-by-step -step lesson plans with links, with, um, with links to all of the material that you need um, to try and help um, adapt your teaching to the new situation. Um, this as well, Victoria, do you want to talk us through? Yeah, it's a support pack again that we have put together, our colleagues in Cambridge have put together um, in the last couple of weeks and it has a lot of resources, lesson plans, uh, teacher uh, material as well. So um, everything is there, it's easy to, to find everything, so please have a look at it. Yep, check it out. It's a nice, big, interactive PDF, again, with links to all of our resources and materials. 
Um, and I think we've timed that just about right, haven't we? Was yes. it <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks to all of you for coming. And thank yeah. you to Yulia and to the Moscow office for having us. It's lovely to um, speak to so many different people teachers from across the world. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. I know we've squeezed a lot into our 35 minutes. But as we said, there will be a follow-up email with a nice document with links to everything that we've spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to David for keeping yeah, up with us in you. the chat box. So any questions just for the last minute or so? Yep, summaries will be sent, a nice big document with all the links. And yes, everything we've mentioned is free. Um, yeah. Beyond what we've mentioned, yep, the Karen Saxby website, great resource, and Robinson as well. There are two big young learners authors. Uh, they both have their own dedicated websites with links to Cambridge stuff, but their materials as well. Mm -hmm. um, Digital Teacher is free. Everything we've spoken about today is free. Yeah, and I have also seen a, a question about where the posters can be found, and they are all available on our website but uh, for each of the levels, but uh, we will send the, the links after the yeah, webinar. we will put the links. Uh, we'll put the links to Karen and Anne's websites on, on, on the, uh, the follow-up email as well. And if you have a look online for Home Fun, there's a series of five webinars, I think, that are being run by, by our colleagues at Cambridge University Press in Spain and Italy uh, with Anne Robinson and Jane Ritter. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you all very much. Are you going to take over, Julia? Upcoming webinars, basically keep an eye on, on, on the webinar section on uh, the Cambridge website because we do have, we will have more probably next week and the week after and our colleagues mm -hmm. are running lots of other webinars as well. We'll put a link to that on the useful links document which will be sent out afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. George, Victoria, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, great, thank you very much for your presentation, for this useful information. Thank you, David, for sharing all the links in the chat box. Uh, we will uh, add these links to our follow-up email to the participants. So thanks a lot. Thank you for your support. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you very much. Okay. So now uh, I'm ready to um, welcome our next presenter. And uh, uh, Ian is going to speak about is going is going to speak about uh, productive skills how to improve productive productive skills online Ian are you here please uh, start webcasting unfortunately we cannot hear you please uh, turn on uh, the mic Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfectly, right. thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, Russia and beyond. It's still morning uh, here in the UK. Uh, so today I want to discuss uh, improving productive skills uh, online. So I know it's all been very difficult My video camera off because again it should be easier to uh, to hear me um, that way um, it's difficult moving online with smaller children of course and uh, we probably have more problems with them uh, than we have with some of our older uh, students um, okay so uh, 
I'm going to uh, start using the slides in a moment. Um, just to say, Julia, uh, I seem to be unable to change um, the, the slides uh, for some reason. I was able to change the previous people's slides, but I'm not able to move my own. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so key issues for uh, YLE in the online context. So it's unnatural, uh, which of course it is for all of us, but for children, it's perhaps more difficult uh, to breach that gap uh, between what would, we would have in a classroom and between what we would have online. I know I find this quite difficult myself. Uh, when I'm training to be an examiner and we have to watch the videos, I find myself sort of criticizing the examiners and the wallpaper and uh, the way the examiner is speaking and not actually listening uh, very much to what the candidate uh, is saying in the video. And of course, that doesn't happen in real life. We can also compare this to reading. Uh, if you remember when ebooks first came out, we had to read them on the computer and they weren't very popular. But when e readers came out and we could actually hold them, and that physical contact that we've always had with books became possible with e readers, then they became more popular. Uh, so, unnatural for children. Home distraction. So, of course, in the classroom, we can limit um, the things around them. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of my time at the beginning of the year uh, telling parents not to let students bring their favourite toys to school, uh, not to let certain children have, um, you know, very sparkly pens. Uh, you know, people in, in Russia, I always remember, uh, there's always one little girl who has these blistyashi uh, pens, which all the other little girls want to borrow and which you won't let them use um, which uh, you know can cause could cause problems also those t-shirts with the sequins on that they spend all day ruffling up and down uh, which which causes problems so in the classroom we can uh, we can deal with these things but at home you know they've got their toys they've got things that their mum has left on the floor that perhaps shouldn't be there um, you know electricity sockets all those sort of dangerous things which we as the teacher would normally uh, you know be in charge of uh, sorting out but which uh, is left to the parents so you know there's more things to uh, distract their attention you're just one one of many uh, parental interruptions now I always see um, young learner um, lessons as an opportunity for mum to go and you know do some cooking do some cleaning talk to her friends uh, try and dye her hair with some uh, product which is not normally used for dyeing your hair um, go and drink a pint of wine in the bathroom um, but sometimes parents or grandparents can try to get a bit too involved uh, particularly um, if they say oh no he knows this word and then they sort of try to steal this word out of their child who obviously doesn't know it and I think there can be a bit of a sensory overload so again I don't know if you found this but I find um, that sort of one hour on Zoom uh, is more draining uh, for me, sort of, uh, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, than a whole day um, of teaching. And uh, there's a link here um, for an article, um, which you can look at later, which explains why Zoom life is so much more exhausting uh, than real life. And basically it's because the, uh, you know, the quality of the audio that we hear and video that we see is not true to real life. So we're having to use our eyes and ears a lot more. And when you factor in, of course, that this is a different language, uh, that's probably why we feel even more tired and why our students feel even more tired. So this can really affect um, our students and their um, abilities to participate, I think, in, in lessons. And then what can happen um, is that when it comes to productive skills, uh, especially speaking, um, you know that the students they speak a lot but they speak in their own language uh, or they speak very little uh, some students have real issues um, you know actually understanding that it's not a video that they can actually interact with you um, at the same time so we've got this question here uh, how do we deal with parental interruptions uh, because of course we don't want to embarrass parents in front of uh, in front of the students um, I quite like to give parents tasks to do and I think that's quite useful so sometimes I say okay now we need mummy uh, to be involved or I say oh we don't need uh, 
we don't need mummy for this task and I give that as a hint uh, that perhaps you know mum can go off and, and do something else and you know sometimes give them a bit of a wave uh, and that usually uh, you know gets them going because mum usually has something more interesting and useful to be doing anyway okay uh so i need to move on to my next slide now again i still don't have uh have access to them thank you uh online writing okay so um you know writing it's a bit of a problem um equipment so you know uh a family might have only one or two laptops uh, in a house and you know mum and dad probably need to use these for their work to make sure that they earn money to be able to pay uh, for English lessons so a child might be using a tablet uh, an old tablet or a phone um, even to do this uh, typing versus writing by hand okay so you know often with young learners starters movers flyers there are especially at starters they're just learning how to use um, pens and pencils and we spend a lot of our time focusing on handwriting and then suddenly actually we're moving across to a keyboard now as you'll remember yourself when you first had to use an english keyboard as opposed to a you know a russian keyboard for example or a chinese keyboard with the letters being in different places it takes a really long time uh, to write something out uh, if we're getting students to write things by hand and holding things up to the screen, well, sometimes it's the wrong way around. And, you know, as a teacher, we're trained to read, uh, you know, back to front, upside down, inside out. Uh, but for other students, uh, it can be difficult. So therefore, to do some kind of interactive writing can be quite difficult in that way. Time. OK, so what do you do uh, when students need to go and do some writing? Um, do you, you know, close the um, close the Zoom session? Do you put them into little groups? Do you put them back into the waiting room? Um, you know, it's again, what do you do uh, in, in, in that situation? What I tend to do when I want them to do some individual writing um, is to put them into uh, breakout rooms on their own. Uh, and therefore, I can just drop in. Um, on each one uh, or I ask them to just turn off their video and audio but to stay in the main room uh, and what I do is then I play on my computer a piece of music uh, usually a sort of film um, film music uh, music something like Enya that's not really going to distract them but gives them a certain amount of time uh, I also find Mozart is quite useful for this, um, especially some kind of overture, because they always end uh, in the same way, so the students know when they need to start finish their writing. So it usually goes da 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 da, and therefore everybody knows uh, it's time to come back and turn their um, turn their uh, session back on. If they have been handwriting and they hold it up and it is the wrong way round, then normally I. Uh, read it out or I will type it in myself uh, to the um, on the sort of desktop uh, that's available uh, on on zoom because you know they're, they're producing quite short um, pieces uh, there um, yeah as well as using the chat but of course with starters and movers it can be a bit tortuous waiting for them um, to to write things out in that way but of course as they become more familiar with it uh, then the chat box should be fine um, as well so key issues there for speaking and for um, reading so uh, can I have my next slide please Okay, so combining solutions. So what um, I want to share with you today um, are really two sort of major um, activities which we can use to um, further and to extend both speaking and writing. And this one is simply called uh, extend the sentence. So here we have um, a picture of somebody that uh, some of us will, will know, those of us who use the Kids Box series. Um, so this is Monty, uh, Monty the mouse, uh, who's uh, the favorite toy uh, of one of the characters in the book. And of course, every now and again, the toys come alive. Um, and so all you need for this uh, is 
a picture um, of Monty, the characters from the books that you use, um, or any picture of uh, something that you've been covering um, recently. Uh, so how does the activity work? Again, if I can have my next slide, please. Yeah, so we simply show and share the image and flashcard and ask one student to say or to write in the chat box what they see. So, for example, with Monty, um, it would be a mouse. Then we should simply ask the next student to add another word. A grey mouse, a small grey mouse, a small grey and pink mouse, a small grey and pink mouse with a tail, a small grey and pink mouse with a curly tail, a small grey and pink mouse with a pink curly tail tail and so on okay and the idea is to get the longest sentence possible and ideally if you've got a small um if you have a small group um it means that you know the person who said who gave the easiest answer who said a mouse will then have to say the most difficult uh sentence at the end so I think it's useful because it sort of gets students uh, competitive. They always want to ask another word. Um, they always want to add another word. They want to be the winner. And it really gets us to use the vocabulary that we already have. So it's quite simple. But if we look at a little bit of the reasoning behind it, if I can have my next slide, please. Okay, reasoning notes them. So students can use their competitive instincts. Then the next point I think is perhaps the most useful. Teachers can reformulate sentences which teach uh, which teaches um, YLs about word order. Mm -hmm. So simple things like uh, the order we put colours in. So for example, if it's a zebra, it's black and white, not white and black. Again, of course, in Russian you would also say black and white. Yeah, um, but for example, sometimes when we start thinking in another language, uh, things like that go out of the window. So, uh, you know, why we would put black before white, grey before pink in this in this way. Uh, it also means that we can teach the words that go between the words on the word list, uh, which often get left out. Um, so we'd say, you know, uh, a mouse with a curly tail, not who, uh, not. Um, we don't need to say has got, we can just use with, uh, but with often gets talked quite uh, a bit later on uh, than the parts of the body, for example. So teachers can feed in those important linking words and phrases, which aren't always covered explicitly uh, in course books. And also teachers can focus on spelling. Uh, so if your students have written uh, something down for you and they've, and they've misspelled it, you can actually incorporate this into your um, error correction there. And hopefully you will see over time that they will start to um, spell a bit better uh, because, of course, they will be reading more as well. Okay, uh, can I have my next slide, please? Okay, so uh, this one is a little bit more uh, out there, um, perhaps. Uh, Japanese poetry. Uh, so you know, there's the old joke about Japanese poetry that 99.4% uh, uh, of the UK population doesn't read Japanese poetry and of the 0.6% that they do, 98% of them are lying. So it isn't really very popular but um, you know I think it is useful to be creative but of course uh, young learners are quite limited um, in what they're able to do, but the form of one type of Japanese poetry I think is quite useful. Uh, so let's move on uh, to the next slide, please. Uh, someone there saying it looks Chinese to, to, to them. Uh, very possibly. Uh, I, I'm not a reader of either language myself. Uh, so the haiku uh, is a simple form uh, of poetry, um, which has just three lines uh, in each poem. So the first and the third line have five syllables and the second has seven syllables. Okay, so choose a set of words, for example, animals, family members, fruit, uh, whatever you're covering um, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, 
And then I think it's important to share your own example. Example. Uh, count the syllables on your finger. So, of course, the word syllable is quite difficult um, to describe. So we go through something like banana, and then we clap them out. Banana. Uh, so that they understand uh, what the word syllable is. I don't think you need to translate the word um, syllable. Okay, so read your example to your students again and get them to clap the syllables as you read them. Okay, uh, give the students time to make up their own individually. Uh, so again, you can put them into uh, a separate space uh, in groups or uh, as homework. So if I can have my next slide, please, and we'll look at some examples. Okay, so here are two examples. Uh, the sad red panda. Is he a hungry red panda? The hungry red panda. A long yellow snake. Is it a dangerous snake? Run away from it. Okay, so not particularly artistically wonderful, but they have the right number of syllables. They use uh, the animal vocabulary and they use other words that perhaps students have learned along the way. So we've got their sad, hungry, two very important words uh, when you're working uh, with, uh, with, with small children uh, there. And then colors, of course. Um, or, all right. Uh, so, you know, it might seem quite a simple form of poetry, but actually I'm reading a book at the moment, which uh, I've got my video off so you can't see it, by my favourite author, or one of my favourite authors, Diana Wynne-Jones, uh, who you may know as the author of Howl's Moving Castle, um, which was turned into a film. Um, and there's a series of poems in this book um, about the moon and their moon haiku. So clouds transform the moon into a marble smear. Is it a new moon? The moon races the sky, not quite round. I do not quite believe it. OK, so, you know, they can be as simple, as silly or as artistic and complex uh, as you would like them to be. Uh, but I think it's really nice that students can, in what, 17 syllables, create um, a piece of creative writing, which again, you can correct, or you can make suggestions to, um, other students can make suggestions to, but it does actually count by itself uh, as a piece of art. And then, of course, what you can do is you can collect these and create um, you know, a poster on, on, on Word or on Paint uh, and then post it on your social media platforms. And I think that's really nice. If I can have my next slide, please. Okay, so reasoning. So harness the student's creativity, okay. Um, you know, as I said before, there are a lot of distractions around. And if we're getting students to use their brain um, as well as just listening and replying sort of automatically to what we're doing, then we'll find that those uh, extraneous, uh, you know, uh, distractions will disappear into the background and they'll focus a lot more on what you're doing online. And therefore, when you go into the more traditional aspect of your lesson, you'll hopefully keep some of that attention. Um, it helps with reasoning, uh, I think, because students need to give a little bits of explanation. So if you think of the example I gave about the snake, uh, is it dangerous? OK, then you should run away from it. Um, introduces syllables in an enjoyable way, which teaches uh, pronunciation or helps with the teaching of uh, pronunciation. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you have had problems with teaching interesting, uh, because of course, once students are able to read, they think it should go interesting. Uh, which is so much longer. Whereas, uh, you know, once we've taught the notion of syllables uh, and then we started counting them on our fingers and clapping them out, it's much easier to teach um, the pronunciation of words. Also, I find it useful in teaching the schwa uh, sound, particularly at the end of words. 
Uh, a great way to revise recently learnt vocabulary, of course, younger learners often lose words if they don't use them. Uh, so if we're doing the animals unit at the moment, uh, I can still bring in the colours from the last unit or the unit before that as well and get them to recycle it. Uh, which is very useful. And the test can be repeated, uh, I would say, even with the same topic uh, and the same students, because, of course, each, uh, you know, each panda haiku uh, will be slightly different from the previous panda haiku, I think. If I can have the next slide, please. OK, so for stronger students, so if we're thinking about flyers, now often we have students in flyers who are maybe 9, 10, perhaps 11 years old. Uh, sometimes their level of English is, is quite strong, actually, almost too good for flyers, but they're sort of uh, educationally too young to move on to the sort of four schools um, materials in that way. Uh, we can actually make this task a lot more difficult, uh, which is that we have to create a series of haikus um, and each time the, uh, the key word has to include one more syllable. So here we've got um, dog, one syllable, panda, two syllables, elephant, three syllables. And of course, we would then work all the way up uh, to a five syllable animal. Now, in the comments section, I have a very short task for you. Can anybody think um, of an animal? Uh, whose name uh, or consists of five syllables. Hippopotamus, yeah. Hippopotamus is a good, hippopotamus. Good one. Um, if I can have my next slide, this is the one that I thought of. Duck-billed platypus. Okay, uh, so the haiku I came up with was uh, duck-billed platypus, the one duck-billed platypus, duck-billed platypus. Uh, okay, and I think the students, they find that, um, you know, really funny um, to do, and they really want to, again, to beat, to beat you, to beat each other, to come up with the most creative um, haikus. Uh, the one that I found actually most interesting from an artistic point of view from what students produce is furniture. Uh, and they've actually come up with some really interesting uh, ideas um, relating to uh, furniture. Okay, if I can have my next slide, please. Okay, so uh, as always with my um, webinars, I like to include a sort of bonus activities. And I saw um, in the chat here, I realise it's become a little bit a bit distracted by by some problems uh, people have been having um, with with their with their lessons. And somebody did recommend um, that songs um, are very useful. So if anybody ha uh, out there came uh, to my seminar for um, BKC uh, back in February, uh, so long ago when we were able to meet and speak to each other um, in person. Um, I went through this song called Aching Drum, uh, which is a really nice interactive song where students actually need to participate and add things in. Uh, so Aching Drum, as you can see here, is a man who lives in the moon, and he's quite a strange man uh, because he is made of food. OK, so he sits in the moon and he plays a ladle. A ladle is like a big spoon uh, and he plays it like it's a guitar. And I'll just sing the beginning of the song for you. There was a man lived in the moon, lived in the moon, lived in the moon. There was a man lived in the moon and his name was Aiken Drum. And he played upon a ladle, a ladle, a ladle. He played upon a ladle and his name was Aiken Drum. Then all his body parts are made of different things. So normally I start off with these things, for example. And his legs were made of bananas, bananas, bananas. His legs were made of bananas, and his name was Aiken Drum. And his feet were made of fish, fish, fish. His feet were made of fish, and his name was Aiken Drum. And his toes were made of peas, peas, 
peas. His toes were made of peas and his name was Aiken Drum. Then I invite the students to name the other parts of the body uh, and what, what they're made of. So, uh, for example, I would say, uh, I would point to the body and say, okay, what is it and what is it made of? Uh, I would say the most popular uh, one for the body is a watermelon. Uh, students always choose a watermelon for, for the body. Uh, and then we do all the other body parts. And of course, depending on the age and level of the student, we can do more or less body parts. So uh, for some, uh, some of them we will do, you know, eyes, ears, uh, nose and mouth. Some of them we'll just kind of do head and hair. Um, for hair, the best one is spaghetti. Uh, which is a really nice word to practice uh, with ki with kids as well, and you can mind that the hair is made of spaghetti. And then, of course, what happens uh, to Aiken Jam is that another person comes from the earth to the moon and eats him. Okay, and he ate a bowl of bananas, bananas, bananas. He ate a bowl of bananas, and he ate a bacon drum. And it goes on like this, so you actually then reuse all the uh, food vocabulary there. Uh, but it's a really nice activity to do because every time you do it, it's slightly different. Uh, different students have different ideas about what the eyes, the ears, the nose and the mouth can be made of um, in that way. And then as a sort of individual cooling task um, or as a home task, I get them to draw um, a conjunct made of the, the fruit and vegetables or, or whatever food that we've used um, to, to show next time. And then, of course, they hold up their picture and then we re-revise the vocabulary then. Um, across the page, um, you can see uh, here a bottle of rum, and this song, it sounds quite macabre, called A Drop of Nelson's Blood, but Nelson's Blood is just another name uh, for rum, and it's a way to um, revise different types uh, of drink. So, of course, this is perfectly usable with adult students, but they will be using different types of drink, uh, perhaps. And the song is quite simple, it goes, Oh, a drop of Nelson's blood wouldn't do us any harm. Oh, a drop of Nelson's blood wouldn't do us any harm. And a drop of Nelson's blood wouldn't do us any harm. And we all fall on behind. And then we all start rowing. So we row the old chariot along. The chariot is your boat. And we roll the old chariot along. And we roll the old chariot along and we all fall on behind so again with the rowing action it keeps them moving uh, and then we ask them to say different types of drink that they would like to introduce so it can be coca-cola oh a drop of coca-cola and then normally i do i i mind sort of opening the can and going good 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 uh, in that way, and though, so we can cover all the different types of drink there. We can cover, um, you know, tea, coffee, different types of fruit juice, uh, which is really nice. And of course, as I said, um, if you use it with um, with adults, then we can have, you know, uh, their, their own songs as well. Oh, a nice G and T wouldn't do us any harm. Yes. Uh, or a pint of Pinot Grigio wouldn't do us any harm. Uh, we've got a question uh, there. Um, are these real songs? Yes, they're real songs. They're not ones that I made up. So if you type in uh, to Google uh, Aiken Drum uh, or A Drop of Nelson's Blood, you can find uh, examples uh, of them there. Um, a Drop of Nelson's Blood, if you've got a group of kids or, or students of any age who really enjoy um, singing, uh, then um, you know that you can actually do it in a round where people start singing at different times and you can create like a little online choir. Um, I'm involved with an online club choir as well and actually that's where I got this uh, uh, drop of Nelson's blood song before. So the main thing is is that you know people are dropping words into the song but there's a part where everyone can join in. Um, you know and it's you know, there, there are lots of songs that we can use to do this, even songs that we wouldn't think of as particularly, particularly interactive. So some of you perhaps know, know the song about Alice the Camel, who has got t 10 humps. Alice the Camel has 10 humps. Alice the Camel has 10 humps. Alice the Camel has 10 humps. Go, Alice, go. 
Okay, and of course the final one is as the camel has no humps, Alice the camel has no humps, Alice the camel has no humps, Alice is a horse. Okay, uh, and I remember one day I was working with my students and they would get on, I could see they were getting a little bo bit bored of doing this song. And one boy put his hand up and said, uh, Monty the mouse has 10 tails. So we started singing about Monty the mouse with 10 tails instead of Alice the camel with 10 humps. And then of course, after that, all the children wanted to come up with ideas. And when they'd learned a new word, usually a new animal or a new thing that they could have, uh, they really wanted to create a new version um, of the song there, uh, which also you know, it made the, the lessons more interesting and also made them uh, you know, a bit more interactive. And I think it's a really nice thing to do um, at the beginning um, or at the end um, of of a lesson yeah we got a little bit there someone was saying about um older students i think you know um as i talked about songs before if you treat it seriously then your students will treat it seriously whether they're three years old or whether they're 85 years old so if you treat songs as an actual educational tool rather than just a bit of fun uh then people um will join in there um all right can i have my next slide please Okay, so um, that's the um, end of that part. Um, I've got some questions um, here, um, which um, I will respond to um, now. Okay, um, so we've got someone here, which I guess is off topic, but um, I will answer it. Um, Anyway, so how to become uh, an examiner. So you, you need to speak to your local um, Cambridge Centre um, about that. And of course, your level of English is important. Um, five years old. Um, you know, I think five year olds can do some of these things. Actually, writing for five years old, I found that five year olds can type better than they can um, then they can write by hand because they're used to typing already. They're used to sending messages, usually emojis, but they can usually participate there um, a bit better. Um, of course, usually if you're five, you're not taking a Cambridge exam, but perhaps if you've got, come an international background, you may as well start with starters at five or six years old. Um, why not? Um, and then we've got somebody here saying that, um, you know, spun, something about SpongeBob. Yeah, SpongeBob's quite, quite good, but I don't really like his pronunciation there um, all right so thank you um, very much and thank you to Julia for uh, managing my slides for me um, so I wish you all well stay at home stay safe stay well uh, and I hope to join some of you again uh, in the future if anybody wants to email me you can see my email there uh, thank you very much uh, and goodbye thank you Ian uh, that was really great. So now I'm happy to introduce the next presenter. I hope you already can see this slide. Um, just a second. We're uploading it. Okay. Okay, great. Teaching receptive skills to young learners. Gulfem Aslan, our amazing presenter from Turkey, our lovely colleague, uh, ELT teacher, consultant. So Gulfem, please join us. So click on the go on air button and um, Yes, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, see. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? That's the important thing. Okay. Can you hear me, everyone? Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. 
Yes, I think I can. Right, I'm going to go for it. Shall I start, Julia? Yes. Yes, okay. Ah, well, I'm very, very sorry about all those technical hitches, everybody. Um, well, you know, uh, <laughs> this is technology for you. It can work and we can go absolutely haywire like we did just now. Not to worry. And well, we're in at last. Okay. So let's just try to talk about the skills here. We're going to talk about uh, Yulia, I think you need to change my um, slide for me as well. <laughs> no, I need to go the other way. Um, I would like to talk about teaching or developing the receptive skills, which are, of course, uh, listening and reading. So uh, if I can just change my slide, uh, which has got stuck again. Yes, hello. <laughs> now, the now the slides are stuck. Okay, uh, if you could do that for me. Yulia, that would be wonderful. Uh, I can't get to see my arrow for the next slide. Yes, lovely. Is it coming? I hope it's coming very soon. Because, uh, okay. Very quickly, I will be talking about very quick two points about the aims of this webinar. What I'm going to be uh, presenting. Um, okay, so if we could just have the next slide, all right. Okay, so we've got the well, I can't see it, but uh, apparently you can. So, um, the aims of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, whoever's done that for me. <laughs> okay, the aims of the webinar are to develop uh, students' listening and reading skills, and of course to uh, prepare them for the tasks in the Cambridge Young Learners exams. So we need to change the slide pretty quickly now to the next page, if possible. Um, ah, thank you. We've done that page, okay. Very quickly, we're going to be talking about the tasks, specific tasks for listening and reading in starters, movers and flyers. So if we could go on to the next page, please. The next slide. Um, no? <laughs> Yay! Great. All right. Good. If we could get the rest of the picture, I can only have half the slide for some reason. I can't see it, but maybe everybody else can. So I'll just talk about it. What we've got is here just a very quick example for those of you who are not familiar with the exams. Just uh, three different examples of some of the text types that you might get in starters, movers and flyers. And you can see it doesn't matter about the context. Uh, the content. Uh, you can see that the first one is quite short, very simple language for starters, quite a short dialogue, um, about two exchanges each person. The movers dialogues are a little bit longer, four to six exchanges, a little longer, and the flyers dialogues are, well, quite complicated by a, a little bit more complex. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the progression of how things get a little bit more difficult from starters to, to flyers. So if we could change the, uh, the slide, please. Is that possible? Um, wish I could do it. Ah, I think I'm going to be able to do it. Good. Okay. So if we look at the next slide, we're going to be talking about what we need to be able to teach young learners. And of course, the first thing we need is to motivate them. Motivation, motivation, motivation. And this isn't just for young learners. This is for all of the students who sit in front of a, a, a camera or a, um, a glass cold machine, if you like, a computer, a screen, and maybe get bored, maybe go to sleep. 
So we need to do something to motivate them. Well, one thing that I do quite a lot to motivate my young learners is um, I wear different hats. You see, this one is a, a policeman's hat. Uh, I don't know what nationality the policeman is, but I also want to thank all the uh, community workers at the moment because of COVID-19. All of those doctors, nurses, policemen, um, firefighters, everybody who's a communication community worker, I would like to take my hat off to you. And I would like to motivate them, uh, my students, by wearing a different hat halfway through. <laughs> I don't think I look lovely, but who cares? Um, and of course, children love it. And they also wonder what, what I'm going to do next. So um, again, I have three different hats per, per lesson, perhaps. I might even wear, uh, this is a pot. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, motivation. A friend of mine who works at a university teaching um, teenagers, A2 level, she gets them to stand up and dance at the beginning of every single lesson. And she gets up and she dances with them too. So yes, we need that motivation. We need them to build up their confidence. We need some element of fun. I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, an hilarious lesson full of jokes and funny stories, but it does have to be enjoyable. So find something that is enjoyable. I very much enjoyed those songs a few minutes ago by Ian. I thought they were lovely. Who's calling me crazy, by the way? <laughs> well, maybe I am because I'm also a grandmother. And so I like doing lots of different activities with my six, seven-year-olds. We do need to plan very carefully when we're teaching and we need to have lots of preparation. I, I've got lots of papers, plans, all sorts of things here. Look at this. Yeah, you could just have a bell. Uh, all sorts of things to keep the students, the pupils interested. <laughs> okay, so we also need to make sure that it's the right level. So always be aware of your language level. Filter uh, the, your language. Yes, you're calling me a crazy teacher, someone. Natalia, thank you. <laughs> And when we make sure that they understand, we need practice, 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 practice makes perfect, as you know. So, oh, I can actually change my slide. This is amazing. Oh, it's gone again. No, sorry. Yes, okay. So now we need to sit down. We've got all of these things here. We need to plan our lessons for young learners and get everything ready before we actually go teaching online. Um, oh, God, that's quite difficult, isn't it? We Oh, somebody's saying Fotima. We sing a song before starting the lesson. I think that's wonderful. I also think if they can see each other, if you have a grid view where every student can see everyone else, it's wonderful just for them to connect with their friends because they miss their friends so much, don't you think? Um, so get them to connect with their friends, just two or three minutes to say silly things to each other and then you can start the lesson, say, hello, we're starting now and then go back to individual. Okay, so um, let's think what kind of ideas we have for lesson planning. Thank you. Oh, I don't know who changed the slide, but it's marvellous. Right, now, we've got so many materials, as my predecessors, my previous um, uh, presenters were talking about, we have handbooks for teachers, we have word lists. Can we carry on? Can we show the next slide, please? Quite, quite hastily, yes. We have lots of um, sample tests. We have picture books, we have story books, we have course books, we have lots of lesson plans. We have so many materials that will help you to plan your lessons. And of course, the website is www.cambridgeenglish.org. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the next slide quite quickly. Now, let's look at the, some of the activities, the tasks, we, we might call them, that young learners will be required to do while reading or while uh, listening. 
So I've put them up quite big here, unjumbled sort of mixed up letters or some words that are put together and you have to separate as if they're one long word and you have to separate and find each word or get them to choose a word from a box maybe or to choose a letter or a picture and match with a definition or something to color so they might listen to a definite uh, description the balloon is red and they may have to color the balloon red they may have to circle and they may have to draw lines or tick or cross they may have to complete the sentences as we heard just now from the previous presentation with one word or one or two words for reading for writing it will be a sentence but for reading it will be one or two words they may have to spot the difference between two pictures and write something about it or they may have to listen or read and find the word or the number yes we were saying um, we could have lots of different activities okay um talk about listening and drawing okay i'm not going to this is technically technically quite difficult for me to also have a an audio um element to this webinar so i'm going to read the uh the actual text myself the the um tape script but of course we need two people so how am i going to do this this is how i'm going to do it and this is what my young learners love i have mr what i call he, he's my little friend hello everyone this is mr owley hello um so i'm going to read with mr owley is that all right so i'm going to be miss box i'm miss box all right and this is mr owley so let's read the conversation now what i'd like you to do is to listen and draw a line so which person in the picture are we talking about do you understand that i hope so okay <laughs> all right so let's talk so here's a photo of me miss box um I'm in the tree with my friends in the park. Look. Oh, yes, Owly. Um, who's that? Who's that there? Oh, the boy with the cats. Yes, the boy with the cats. Oh, his name is Pat. He's holding a cat in his arms now. Pat loves animals. <laughs> Oh, that's very good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so hopefully they will be able to draw a line between the boy who's called Pat and the name underneath it. All right, thank you so much. This is marvelous, magical. People are changing my slides for me. Okay, this is another little script. Okay, perhaps I could have. Um, somebody else to uh, help me this is uh ferdinand okay ferdinand's a bit big he's got a very big mouth i'm afraid okay <laughs> okay so let's have ferdinand read them out okay so look at the pictures children and we're going to look at what different children like to read to eat and drink so let's start with Grace. Grace is an example. Grace likes to eat some bread. Can you see the bread? Good. Can you see the line between Grace and bread? Good. This is an example. So let's go to the next. Uh, uh, no, let's stay on this. <laughs> and let's have a little conversation. So uh, Ferdinand's going to read it out for you. Hello, um, Alex uh, enjoys breakfast. Um, Alex likes to eat a banana for breakfast. Um, May loves lunch. Uh, May likes to drink lemonade for lunch. Uh, and now Matt. Uh, Matt likes to drink uh, lemonade too, but 
He likes ice cream <laughs> for lunch. And uh, what does Eva like for dinner? Oh, Eva likes chicken. <laughs> and what about our friend Sam? Oh, yes, Sam likes rice. Okay, bye. Now, you could do it this way, or if you're going to read it out, this is an idea. Just put a piece of paper in front of your mouth. And now, why is this? This is so that they can get used to listening and not lip reading. So I've put some lipstick on for you. Can you see? Okay. So, <laughs> so they won't see your lips. Okay, let's have a look at the answers. Let's see if we've got the answers. If they were able to join the names and the pictures. Did you manage to get that? Mm -hmm. That's the next slide. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Good. Oh, dear. The lines have slipped a little bit, but never mind. You get the idea. They managed to draw lines. Actually, <laughs> most of them will probably have uh, <laughs> uh, slipped lines as well. Okay, so let's go on to another activity we could do for listening with young learners. This is something that you will find, just like uh, the previous presentation, you will find on the website. So if we can have the next slide. This is something that uh, you will find on YouTube, and it's a lovely song. I'm not going to try and sing it because I don't have a beautiful voice like Ian does. But this is a song called At The Zoo. And there's the YouTube um, website for you. And it's a song about at the zoo, and they will have to listen and tick. So listen and tick. Now, listen and tick. So this is something that I get my students to make. Very simple. It's a cross on one side, and I use this all the time. It doesn't have to be on a stick. It can be on any piece of paper, just a, a post-it, a piece of colored paper, or two, two different colored pieces of paper. Um, this is for no, and this is for yes. And I really think this is important because I want to get feedback. I really want to know what's happening with them. So then I would go to the grid view, and I would say, so everybody, did you listen to the song? Okay. Was there a lion? Is there a lion in the song? Okay, so hold up your sticks now. And everybody would hold up their stick. Okay. <laughs> All right. So is there a crocodile in the song? Hold up your signs now. Yay. That's right. Good. So let's change the slide to the next one. So the second part will be what the animal does. Is it mentioned and what the animal does? So they will have to write, maybe just take notes, or maybe they can write in a chat box or the message part of your platform, or maybe they can go to one of those breakout rooms if you have that kind of platform. So they will listen to the song at least two, maybe three times. This isn't an exam. Let them listen to it three or four times, especially if they seem to be enjoying it. You see, ladies and gentlemen, um, I watch my, my young uh, grandchildren trying to get their lessons online, their English lessons, and I, I feel so sorry for them because they get disinterested, demotivated. They start playing with other things, even just a pen and they lose the thread. So we've got to keep them active and we've got to nominate them by name when we're asking for things, for answers. Please try not to just throw open uh, an open question to the class. So please try to nominate everyone by name when you're going to ask a question. Don't say who knows unless you're getting them to use something like this. Um, one other thing we can do, uh, this is again with that same song, we can do who went to the zoo and what did they say, and they can fill it in. 
while we go on to the next slide, I'm going to talk about another activity we could do with this. Very simple, again, very good for developing listening skills for specific information. Uh, it can be tick cross, it can be true or false, it depends on what you want. It can be yes, no. Um, I ask them to put their cards up when I call out different sentences and they tell me if it's true or if it's false. So if I said, the sky is always blue. All right, is that true? No, that's false. If you said false, you would be right. So uh, baby dogs are called puppies. Ready to answer? Right or wrong? Yes, oh dear. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, one more. Dolphins have four legs. Right or wrong? That's right. I knew you'd know that one. What about pandas? Pandas, big black and white bears. They live in China. Is that right or wrong? Yeah, that's right. I was only joking. Etc. Now you could have lots of sentences and uh, it doesn't really matter. It's practice, practice, practice and fun. Okay, can we go on to the next slide now, please? I don't have any slides at the moment. Can you see anything? <laughs> oh dear, I think the link has gone. Has it gone? That's finished. Um, can you still hear me? At the zoo, we've done that one. I think we can carry on to the next slide, if possible. I have a guardian angel called Yulia. She's fantastic. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without her. Um, but I can only see half of the slide. Okay, while we're going on to see the next slide, hopefully, um, there are some names that I use over and over again in the questions. Children's names, boys and girls' names, like Maria. That's, that's probably a Russian name, or Natalie. Beautiful names, by the way. Um, but these are British or American or native speaker names. And sometimes children don't realize that they are names. Um, for example, um, Hugo has, is one, a name that has been added recently. Are you still with me? Are people out there? I hope you are. <laughs> okay, so Hugo. Now, um, if we get to see that slide, Perhaps I could ask them to go to a breakout room or just for a minute try to unjumble these mixed up letters of names. So I've already given, if the word is Alex, if the name is Alex, I've already given the capital A in the jumbled up word so that they know that the, the name starts with an A. That will help them a little bit. It still might be difficult for seven-year-olds, maybe eight, nine, ten-year-olds might be able to do that now. So um, I still can't see a slide, unfortunately. Oh, but I think you can, so that's good. <laughs> so um, try to guess the names of the people in the box. Let's say that they've done that and that we've done some feedback on it. Okay. We can go on to the next slide now. And I can ask people, so I can say, Maria, uh, what's the next name? Is it a boy or a girl? So what's the name at the top of the list on the right? The top, the, the name. Have you got it, Yulia? Oh, well done, Natalia. Good. So they can write it in their message boxes too. And some people are saying to me, well, um, I'm sorry, but what's the problem? Have okay, we, okay. Have we got a connection problem? Okay, uh, I will turn on the video. Uh, show me the, the computer. <clears throat> can, can you show me the computer? Yeah, you are not presenting at the moment. So um, can you click on F5, please?
Okay, we can see you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <gasps> Amazing. Anyway, let's go on very quickly to the next activity. I just want to tell you about these things that I do, hopefully. Now, uh, we have finally found those names. So which one of these? Alex, is that a girl's name? Or is it a boy's name, Alex? Or is it a unisex name for both boys and for girls? So that's the next one. Uh, I'd like them to get together maybe or just think by themselves. And I'm going to say, Alex, do you think Alex is a boy or a girl? Or do you think Alex can be a boy or a girl? And again, I get them to prepare these things and they love doing it because it's arts and crafts. So pink for a girl, blue for a boy and green for a unisex name okay so let's have uh kim ready for the answer boy girl or both kim ready steady go <laughs> of course i've dropped my stick never mind i'll get it now good what about matt do you think Matt is a boy, a girl, or both? Could be a boy or a girl. Ready? One, two, three. Yay! Matt is a boy. Good for you. Yes, thank you for answering. Okay, so we could carry on like that. Uh, some of these names are quite tricky. For example, Sam is quite tricky. Uh, Sam can be Samantha, obviously, or Samuel. Um, Kim could be Kimberly or Kimiko or I can't even think of a boy's name now. Patrick or Patricia and we have, uh, what else? Alex, Alexander or Alexis. So I think they should be aware because sometimes there will be sentences starting with he is, she is and they won't know. So lots of practice. Now, how can we practice these things? Well, I can say, okay, all the girls, you will do what I ask you to do. So we're going to do drama online, if possible. <laughs> Let's see. I would have the grid view, and I would say, all the girls, if I say a girl's name, you're going to act it out for me, just with your hands and your bodies. So I might say, Anna is playing the piano. Go, show me. So I want everybody be, to be doing this. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to say another name now. Listen. And if it's a unisex name, everybody does it. If it's a boy's name, only the boys do it. And if it's a girl's name, just the girls do it. So listen. Pat is talking on the phone. Show me. All right, drama online now. <laughs> as, as much as possible. But again, it's familiarizing them with the names and also keeping them interactive. Activity. Lots of changes of activity every five, ten minutes. Okay, so we can carry on doing this. Um, Hugo is combing his hair. Ready? So, boys, please. Good. Thank you for changing the slide for me. I'd like you to take a blank piece of paper. Let's do a dictation, but I'm going to dictate a picture. Have you got a, a blank piece of paper and a pencil? Okay. Right. Ready? <laughs> oh, some people are saying some very nice things. Thank you so much. You've really motivated me. Okay. Now, one, take a big piece of paper and draw a big circle in the middle of your page draw a big circle in the middle of the page all right the second thing we do draw a small triangle in the center of the circle draw a small triangle in the center or in the middle of the circle 
Okay, number three. Draw two rectangles on each side of the circle. Draw two rectangles on each side of the circle. Number four, draw a heart underneath, under the triangle. And finally, draw two stars, two stars between the triangle and the rectangles, one on the left of the triangle and one on the right. So hopefully, abracadabra, can we change the side please? Abracadabra, here we go. I hope you've got something that looks like, <laughs> it's coming, <gasps> here it is. Yay, did you get something that looks like that? Okay, <laughs> I hope so. Well, it can be sort of like that. Okay, so that's another fun activity, lots of listening. If you like, again, you can cover your mouth with a piece of paper just to make sure that they don't see or lip read. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, another little listening activity. Uh, this one's all about recognising sounds. And while we're recognising sounds, uh, I ask my students to go to the kitchen, because they're at home anyway, to go to the kitchen and get themselves a little cooking pot. I hope it's clean with a clean bottom. <laughs> okay, and so they can tap on those uh, little pots. I don't know if you can see my pot, can you? Uh, maybe it's a bit low down. I'll just hold it here for you. Okay, all uh, right. So, um, again, you have these, uh, what are these? Do you know what these are, these circles? The red circle is the syllable. Um, Ian was talking about syllables just now too. So a word with two syllables, that first one, uh, a syllable that is stressed on the first syllable uh, and a word that is not stressed on the second syllable, a schwa sound maybe. So if this were a, t a town, it might be London, right? London. Or the next one might be something that's not stressed on the first syllable, but stressed on the second syllable, nice and big. So we're making sound visible. Stress syllables, thank you. This is suitable for pre, pre K even. I did it with my six year olds and they love it. And they can hear the difference, it's quite weird, really. Um, for example, Japan, Japan. So a small tap and a big tap. Japan, Japan. But London would be London, London. Let's go on to the next slide and do some activities with these. I really like doing these activities. Mm, and also practicing those vocabulary items. Yes, even five-year-olds can do it. So they're listening for the word stress. Now, I'm going to tap something out and they're going to tell me, is it picture A or picture B? And they can write the message in the chat box. Or they can even write it and hold it up for me, I can see if it's not too crowded, the classroom. So I'm going to tap a word, one of those animals. Which one is it? Shall I do it again? Yay, great. So I hope they found that it was a giraffe. Okay, and a donkey would be And a giraffe would be okay. If we can quickly go on to the next one, yeah, yay, you're all getting it right. And believe me, the children can do it too. Okay, um, I wish this was higher up, but never mind, I'll just hold it like this. Okay, so, um, I think we need to go back one slide. You know it's going to... Is it? Is it correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. No, don't worry. Okay, no, no, don't worry. Here we go. One, two, three. Listen to this. So 
So what do you think it is? A chicken or a tiger? And they do it along with you, don't forget. Okay, well, haha, this is a tricky one because it's both chicken and tiger. Chicken and tiger, both. Thank you. Wow, you're on the ball. Spot on. Next one, very quickly. Oh, I like this one. I like this one because it's. Oh. Okay, so we've got. Is it A or B? Which animal is it? So you can write in your little text box. Is it A or B? Good. Do it with me. You can even tap on the table. Or clap your hands. Oops. Okay, yes, it was a gorilla. And an elephant would be elephant. Okay, it doesn't matter if they get them wrong or if they're copying from each other. The whole point of this is having fun, practicing, and much more input and awareness. So let's go on to the next slide. I don't know how long I've had. I don't know how long I've got to go, <laughs> but I'm carrying on for the time being. Again, with listening, we've got a picture here. And I'm going to talk about the picture. So listen to each sentence and find the wrong word because I'm going to put a wrong word, uh uh, uh uh, in each sentence. So the example would be the carpet on the floor is blue and square. And obviously, they would have to write square is the wrong word because it's blue and round okay ready you're gonna catch the first one okay let's try it so uh the first one is the girl in the middle of the room is brushing her teeth where's the wrong word find the wrong word write it in the chat box for me oh wow oh of course I mean, <laughs> very quickly thank you yes Teeth is the wrong word. So what's the right word? Then I would ask them to replace it with the right word. And they would write hair. Number two, the mother is wearing a blue skirt. Thank you. You're all doing very well. The mother is wearing a blue skirt. Good. So we would change it. What's the right word? Would you put it in your chat box for me? <laughs> That's a good one. I would never have thought of violet. Okay, great. I'm going to cut it short because I think um, I don't know how much time I've had at all. I'm totally mixed up. Never mind. This is what happens. This is life. This is life online. Okay, can we go to the next slide? You are great, actually. <laughs> Despite all of the negativity, you're doing very well. Thank you very much. The next slide is a very easy one. We actually talked about this. I've got a picture of it for you. In that snake, there are lots of names of animals all squashed up together. So <laughs> let's see that slide, I hope, God willing. Okay, maybe if we could just see that slide, um, this one. Yeah. Yay! Oh, oh, I've just seen a spelling mistake in there. So sorry. Read and find all the words in the snake with two A's. <laughs> so sorry about that. So, how many words are there? Ask them to recognize. Now we're on to reading. All of the previous ones were practicing listening. These are on to reading now. So, this is actually visual recognition of word boundaries. So they might try to say pol is a word or polab is a word. So try to get the word boundaries. This is again from the Home Fun booklet, level two. These are mostly A1, but you could do it for A2 as well. If we go on to the next slide, this is one of my favorite ones, this one. 
Um, it's a memory game. Oops. Now then, I'll give you just 30 seconds because you're all teachers and you're all so clever and observant. Can you have a very quick look at the picture? Everybody, look at the picture and try to remember all the things in the picture. Can you? Try to remember what's in the picture. Quite difficult. Ready? Okay, can we change the slide now, please? Thank you. Yay! Oh, we're doing so well. This is teamwork. Okay, so we're going to do true false questions about the picture. And again, you can use your true false cards. Or, as my grandchildren do, thumbs up if it's okay. Thumbs down if it's not okay. Thumbs in the middle if you just don't know. <laughs> Oh, wow. You've got all the words, too. Wonderful. 13 words. Yes. Bravo. Okay, so here's an example. We always do an example so that they know how to do it. But are there three men in the picture? Yes or no? One, two, three. Tell me. Yes or no? No, there aren't three men in the picture. How many men are there in the picture? Yeah, it's just... Two. Oh, somebody's finished it. <laughs> okay, the dinosaur is green. Ready? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you couldn't see the picture. Oh, I'm very sorry about that. Anyway, you get the idea, don't you? Um, there was a very nice thing on the floor. Did anybody notice that there was a spider under the chair? Is that right or wrong? Was there a spider? Under the chair, is there a spider under the chair? Yay! Etc. Okay, you get the idea, I hope. Let's go on to another reading task. We're nearly coming towards the end now because we're doing a few more on reading. And then um, I think I've had my time, I really don't know. So let's go on to the next slide, please. And the next slide is again reading, this time for specific information of the position of things. Now, starters, movers, flyers, especially starters and movers, do concentrate a lot. They focus a lot on prepositions. So it's nice to have pictures with things in different places. And again, one of those tasks that the children will be doing a lot is choosing from a group of words. So I'm just going to show you this. I'm not going to ask you to do it. Look at the picture. Can you all see the picture, I hope? Look at the picture, which I think is quite nice. Um, and the girl is sitting, there's the example, where? On the bed. Yes, prepositions of place. Wonderful. Oh, dear. Some people can see and some people can't see the picture. And it's gone. So anyway, uh, this is one task that we will do a lot of. Again, please write the preposition in the chat box. Not for you. This is what I would say to the students. Actually, we call them students, but they are really pupils, aren't they? Okay. And is that it? I think that's about it. Um, there is just another movers reading and writing. I just wanted to show you one more example of complete that's another task complete the sentence with one word or complete the sentence with one to three words so one word two words or three words and if we see the final slide it says complete the sentences this is reading and writing together and we have it with movers and flyers so here's the example there is a man an old man if you can see the picture hopefully there is an old man sitting under a, and they have to complete. So the girl in the picture is buying what? Maybe I could just show you the picture here if you can't see it. I hope you can. <laughs> I hope you can have the presentation. I, I can give it to you. I hope you can have it. So we'll ask Yulia if she can send it to you. 
So an ice cream, or oh, ice cream is sufficient. Okay, she's buying ice cream. Very good, thank you. Okay, finally, is that the last one? I think that's the last one. On to the final side, so because I'm very sorry about the connection. I would have liked it to be a bit more dynamic, but I enjoyed it, and I hope you did. And I really do hope that when you sit down to do some lesson planning, you have lots of ideas on how to develop listening and reading exams. Oh, sorry, tasks and those skills in your young learners. If we could just have the last slide, please. Is that possible? Yes, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I actually want to learn from you. I'm sure you have much better ideas that I need to learn about. So thank you very much. And I'm going to say goodbye. Okay, and my email address is GGG, because my name's Gil Fan. Uh, oh, you can just remember Granny G, three G's for Granny, GGG, Aslan, A S L A N, at gmail.com. So if you want to write to me, fine. I'd love to do that and keep in touch. Bye bye. Thank you for your patience. Take care. Stay home. Stay safe. <laughs> Dear Gulfam, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. That was really great. Thanks a lot. And uh, now we are ready to uh, welcome our next presenter, Dr. Hisham, Dr. Hisham Al Sagbini, professor. Uh, uh, just a second, I will upload the presentation. Um, Dr. Hisham is going to speak about dyslexia. So extremely useful topic and uh, Dr. Hisham is a real specialist, professional in, on, in this subject. So Dr. Hisham, can you hear me? We can see you. Oh, I can definitely hear you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, sure we can hear. perfectly. So I stop webcasting and the floor to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, it's really a great pleasure to be talking to you today. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful occasion, really, to be talking about uh, something that's uh, so important um, um, in, in our schools. Um, my name is um, Professor Hisham Sagbini, and I'm a specialist in uh, special education and educational inclusion. Uh, I'm the, um, uh, the regional uh, head of assessment um, services uh, in the region for Cambridge Assessment English. So one of the main things uh, that I focus on really is looking at um, uh, inclusion in general, issues related to inclusion. Um, we deal with the various uh, types, uh, with various types of um, of special um, um, of learning difficulties. Um, dyslexia is perhaps one of those uh, learning difficulties that um, require some uh, special um, care and special attention from the teachers. Um, it's not one of those common, um, um, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, learning difficulties that, um, you know, we deal with every day. Uh, however, uh, it is common to a certain extent, um, and in most cases, uh, it goes unnoticed. Um, so while Yulia is uploading the presentation, I can just simply uh, talk about the plan of the day. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, plenty of time. Uh, we only have around 40 minutes. I have to um, to wrap things up at around four. Uh, so I'll try in these 45 minutes to give you um, 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 to give you some basics of how to spot a dyslexic learner and how to really kind of uh, uh, approach dyslexia, hopefully with a different eye. And I'll share with you at the end of the presentation towards the uh, towards the end of the presentation with some te techniques and some uh, tools that we use uh, at Cambridge uh, to support teachers, um, you know, that are dealing with people uh, with learning difficulties. Um, so I'm waiting for Yulia to upload the presentation so we can start.
I have uploaded it for you. Can you see it? No. Mm. Oh, I see now. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Can you change the slides? Yeah, I can see it, but it's not going through. I can see it at the uh, screen at the bottom, but I can't change it um, for bigger display for some reason. Hmm. Mm. Can you take control from this your end? This is the first slide. No, I can't see. I can't yes, see the first course. slide. Yeah. Shall okay. I switch my camera off? Um, so now I'm showing the second slide. Just uh, okay. so if everybody well, is uh, able to see it, that's okay let's... by me. Um, you know, if everybody is, yeah. So I can see that everybody is able to see it except me. <laughs> that's okay. Um, what I'm going to do, I'll use my own slides and I'll, uh, it's the same anyway, and then we can breeze through it if everybody is able to see it. So yeah, I was saying that basically um, dyslexia is a topic that I'm focusing on today. I hope uh, today I'll be able to share with you something useful, something handy that you can really take uh, with you to your class. Um, um, just some uh, general tips and uh, some general strategies that you can apply anyway. And of course, uh, the strategy that we are always focusing on is how can we make our work relevant to the learner? How can we make sure uh, that whatever we're providing is, um, is um, uh, practical? And that's not only in terms of um, the support that we provide, but also in terms of what um, uh, teachers are able to provide to their learners. So the underpinning concept of the underpinning driver uh, for all the work that we are doing now is to make our teaching and learning or the approaches that basically we are um, um, supporting more relevant to our learners. Um, so, Yulia, if you can uh, see me, if you can basically uh, go to slide five, uh, where we can talk about dyslexia in a bit of details. Um, so, dyslexia is um, a very common in certain parts of the world. Uh, in, in, it is... Um, um, one in each 10 people in the UK, uh, you know, kind of suffers from a certain level of dyslexia. Now, in many cases, um, it goes unnoticed. In many cases, we don't really, um, we can't really um, or see or it doesn't really um, uh, affect learning in general. Uh, uh, Yuli, it seems that nobody can see the slides. Hmm. Can you hear me? I'm trying to upload the slides uh, again. Yep. Um, so that everybody yep. could uh, yep. see it. Just sure. uh, a second, sure. please uh, continue speaking and sure. I will uh, change the slides. Perfect, perfect. Right, so uh, I'm not sure really how many people are familiar with the concept of dyslexia. <laughs> Um, so if you are acquainted with dyslexia one way or another, please do let me know in, this, in the chat box so we can basically um, see what we know and what we don't know. Um, as I said, dyslexia is quite common in certain parts of the world. Um, dyslexia is a term that refers to a specific type of learning um, uh, difficulty. And I will talk about the meaning of learning difficulties in a minute and why uh, it is quite um, critical in our work as teachers. Um, so this type of dyslexia, this type of learning difficulties, is very much associated with, um, with uh, languages, so language-based type of learning disability. Now it has a various um, a number of symptoms. Um, in this presentation we will try to highlight some of these symptoms and work through them. It affects particularly skills related to reading. Um, so a dyslexic per, uh, um, uh, person uh, will find it more difficult to read. However, in most cases, dyslexia is not always or is not only associated with reading problems, but also spelling, and that leads to writing issues. Um, in many other cases, um, there are problems that arise, um, you know, from dyslexia related to pronunciations. So that means if a dyslexic person 
um, is taking a, a test, for example, a language test, for example, then chances are that there would be some implications on the reading, um, on the writing, and on the speaking. But how do we really identify that, and how do we make sure that, um, that our learners are equipped with the tools and uh, the right support is available on offer? Just a word of caution, uh, it's very, very essential to remember that dyslexia affects individuals throughout their lives. In other words, any person at any age can be dyslexic. In, in, in a previous life, one of the main things that basically I used to do is diagnose dyslexia. So I used to work with dyslexic with schools um, in various parts of London where we basically work with parents, with families, and with teachers um, to diagnose and, um, and create intervention models for, um, for learners. So the idea, of course, is to be able to discover dyslexia at a very early age. And the reason why it's classified as a learning, dis learning difficulty, because obviously it will impede academic uh, achievement to a certain extent. So, um, um, so it's very important to realize that in some severe forms of dyslexia, um, um, this can qualify them to special education or special accommodations or extra support or services. We'll explore those in a minute. Dyslexia, unfortunately, is not only one type. It's so diverse, so complicated, um, and it has various uh, effects. Now, some of the, perhaps the most common type of dyslexia is related to um, the ability to spell, uh, but there are other types. Uh, dyspraxia, for example, which is the developmental coordination disorder. Uh, we've got dysgraphia, uh, and we've got the attention deficit disorder, um, the ADD, which is quite common in different parts um, of the world. Now, I'm not saying that to insinuate that certain ethnicities could be affected um, uh, in greater levels than others, but what I'm saying is obviously there are statistical evidences and there are numbers that support, um, you know, these types of um, uh, of learning difficulties. So the challenge that we face in most of these occasions is that there is no real data to support our work. And that's really a challenging task. So, um, so the challenge really lies in the fact that we are, we don't really know the size of the problem. We don't really know in our classes how many children are dyslexic and how many of them are not. Now again, I mean, on behalf of the team, I would apologize for not sharing the screens, and I hope I can, um, I can make this up uh, by, uh, um, by my explanations. Uh, and I'm sure we will send the presentation afterwards if it's not coming up now. Uh, it's absolutely fine. So let's enjoy the chat. Let's just um, focus on the concept, and, um, um, and then we will um, you know, share the presentation if it's not coming up now later. So the idea that I'm presenting here, and I want really everybody to take part through the chat box here, um, is to uh, really kind of assess the size of the issue that we are handling today. The challenge is at two levels. In our classes, in my classroom, there is no specific uh, numbers, or there is no specific criteria that, that, that shows the real numbers of dyslexic learners. So that means we have to be equipped, we have to have these, um, this ability to discover who is dyslexic and who's not, and also to be able to provide the right support. So, um, so the concept then is quite wide. Um, from all the different types that I just mentioned, from dyslexia, um, dyspraxia, uh, ADDD, uh, all this um, uh, dysgraphia, I would just simply focus on dyslexia as the main focus of this presentation. So in other words, I'll be focusing on the 
issues related to reading, speaking, and um, writing. So what is dyslexia? Let's just take a step back and focus on what dyslexia uh, means and how do we get it? How do we basically end up dyslexic? And can we have it really at any age of our lives? Well, the answer to this is obviously um, there isn't a, a clear set of reasons for dyslexia. So we don't really know exactly all the reasons that will lead to people or learners becoming dyslexic. However, there are certain uh, brain imagery studies that highlight, that basically focus or, or show that there are certain um, differences between a dyslexic learner's brain and a non-dyslexic learner's brain. Many occasions, it's very much associated with, um, with hearing impairment. So children at a young age, especially newborns, suffer from various levels of hearing impairment at different, different stages of the, their development, and that ultimately leads to incomplete or um, in um, uh, accurate um, development for their brains in terms of how they um, write or read. And that eventually leads to dyslexia uh, being discovered at the later stage of their life. So we don't know. So the bottom line is actually we don't have a clear, um, um, uh, we don't have a very clear set of targets or reasons of how dyslexia happens. And technically we don't, um, or we don't know exactly um, all the reasons. We know that it's very much associated with childhood uh, learning uh, uh, hearing impairment. That's one of the main things that basically we, um, um, you know, uh, are uh, able to identify. We are also uh, able to, um, to clearly and confidently say that dyslexic learners don't necessarily lack intelligence. So there's no relationship between dyslexia and the IQ level of learners, or not even the desire to learn. Evidently, we have lots of statistical um, uh, cases where appropriate teaching methods to uh, students with dyslexia can lead to successful and a very high learner's achievement. So the bottom line is, uh, that this is, yes, we don't know exactly the causes. Some of them are genetic, some of them are not. Um, some of them very much associated with hearing impairment. But the good news is that with a little bit of support, we can um, uh, increase um, um, increase um, uh, learners' achievement. So, um, the other important thing that basically we need to remember, and that's a question that I'm always asked, uh, is it related to a specific learning, a specific uh, racial group or a specific ethnic group? And the answer is definitely not. It occurs in people of all backgrounds and it, all, it affects people with all intellectual levels. That's the first point. The second point uh, is that, as I said, there is, a, there is an evidence that dyslexia runs in families. So having a parent or a sibling with dyslexia increases the probability that you will also have dyslexia. That's a very important point to remember. And that's why in many schools, in, um, when we first apply uh, in higher education or in schooling, the first question that we ask is if there is any history of dyslexia in the family. Now, for many people, dyslexia is identified early in their lives, but in other people it's um, a late discovery and obviously I know lots of people that were able that were uh, that were dyslexia and only found out when they were when they graduated from university and that's another evidence that uh, um, you know various levels of dyslexia could go unnoticed for years we will be focusing on some early symptoms that we can as teachers spot in the classroom and as such provide some assistance and some interventions I have a present. I have a short video that I can share with you, um, but I'm not sure if we can play it. Oh, perfect! <laughs> so the video is coming. All right. So I'll leave you with this short video, and then we can talk about uh, the advice and the support uh, afterwards. Your brain, is Your brain is amazing, and nobody else has one quite like it. 
Although everybody's brain looks the same, they all work differently from each other. Just as we all have different colour skin, hair and eyes, we all have a brain that's individual to us, like a fingerprint. We have different personalities, tastes, strengths and weaknesses. Our brains can even see and understand the world in different ways. One of those ways is called dyslexia, which affects how the brain handles information it sees and hears. Dyslexic people may find it difficult to match letters to sounds and to remember how to spell words. They may even see letters moving around when they're reading. They might have trouble telling left from right. Remembering lots of instructions can be especially hard. They may need more thinking time to remember the right word. As well as memorizing sequences. It may be difficult for them to hold a pencil and to write by hand. Even organizing themselves can be difficult. But everyone with dyslexia is different. It can affect how people feel about themselves. When they struggle with a task that other people find easy, they may feel frustrated, angry or sad. Some dyslexic people try to hide their difficulties because they are worried about what others will think of them. However, thinking differently can be a really good thing. A person with dyslexia may be very good at seeing patterns and solving problems, imagining and rotating objects in their heads, telling stories and making people laugh, taking things apart, understanding how they work and figuring out how to put them together again. Inventing, drawing, painting and making things, seeing the bigger picture. Dyslexic people can do a lot of things. They just might do them in a different way to how others would, and many of them have even become famous for it. There have been many famous dyslexic inventors, writers, scientists, business people, astronomers, paleontologists, actors, cooks, singers, artists, architects, and so on. Dyslexic people have changed the world. So that's really quite interesting. I, mean, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did. So the idea behind it really is to show you the uh, sheer impact on our learning. Um, you know, and obviously the bottom line that basically I'm keen on everybody to, um, oh, oh, great news. I can see the presentation now. So thank you, Yulia. <laughs> All right, so we're here. Perfect. Right, so what I was saying is obviously with dyslexia, we've got various levels um, and various forms. And obviously, it's an issue that um, in many occasions goes undiscovered. Um, however, one, the first thing that basically we need to assess and we need to, um, uh, to uh, focus on is actually the early signs of dyslexia. What makes a dyslexic person dyslexic? I mean, how can we uh, really tell if a person suffers from a learning difficulty um, that needs or that requires intervention? And that's basically the role of this presentation. So that's really the, more, the, 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 the main um, uh, objective behind this brief webinar. Um, I summarize some of the main points uh, that we in our classes could see. Uh, and um, uh, a dyslexic person would properly read and write slowly. That's the first symptom. The second one is a dyslexic person could uh, confuse the order of letters in a word without realizing, without basically making an impact on the pronunciation. So they can read it correctly. They can, sorry, they can, they can read it correctly, but they can't put the right order of the letters. So when you write um, um, uh, car, for example, you uh, spell it as C-R-A. You know what I mean? So uh, um, a learner in this context is able to read it perfectly, um, but 
um, you know, uh, they can't really spell properly. So there is, um, and it doesn't have to be with all the words, by the way. It could be a few words, it could be a few letters. So the most common, statistically, the most common type of, um, um, of, um, of um, you know, uh, letter confusion is between small letter B and small letter D. Um, usually, um, as well, the, uh, our dyslexic learner um, has um, some sort of uh, inconsistent spelling. So I can basically spell um, um, uh, the same word in different forms in different occasions based on various um, factors. So, so uh, the color that's used on the paper, for example, uh, the, um, the size of the paper, all these different things make a big um, a big impact on um, on the accuracy of the spelling. So we've got three main symptoms so far, or three main signs. First of all, the most obvious is the ability to read and write, um, and then confusing the letters of the words, particularly B and P, uh, P and B and D, um, and then having inconsistent spelling. Some less common uh, signs of dyslexia is receiving and following instructions. Um, so a dyslexic learner would find it quite difficult to follow a set of instructions. Um, so if I tell you, um, uh, you know, it's A, uh, A, B, C, D, then, you know, so you need to go A, B, C, and then D. Um, even if it's obvious, even if it's simple, a dyslexic learner uh, at, um, um, at, um, at some level could find it difficult to spell or to follow, even if it's verbal. And another less common symptom is the ability to, um, or the inability to organize. Organizing your room, organizing your uh, day, um, that's also another sign of dyslexia that we see um, in, um, in, in various levels. So um, these are really the common symptoms, um, and obviously, as a teacher, the first thing I would do, if I am, um, you know, kind of uh, um, suspecting any kind of um, um, form of dyslexia in my class, I would just simply go through this checklist. List. I will give them a writing task, and I will check the spelling, and I will check if the spelling is consistent or not. If there are obvious things, of course, there are simple tests that we can do. One of my old tricks, really, is, is the um, a tip of finger touching technique. Uh, so I'll just simply ask them to uh, hide the hand, and I'll touch the fingers, uh, and I'll ask them to write on which finger I actually touched. This means that, obviously, if they are able to answer, um, 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 you know, between an 8 and 10, that they don't really have um, uh, any kind of level of dyslexia. But if they got uh, less than 5, of their fingers uh, being mismatched, then obviously that's a sign um, that we will be um, uh, considering for further uh, analysis. Now, I'm not saying that this technique is, um, uh, you know, 100% uh, accurate. Of course not, because there are other um, variables that could contribute contribute to the accuracy of the results. But nonetheless, it's a good. A fun activity that you can do without uh, patronizing a learner, without making sure, or without basically making it known to the rest of their colleagues um, that uh, they are um, they could be uh, subject to any form of learning difficulty, um, especially in young learners. I mean, obviously, the challenge that we always face is how can we tackle these issues without, without, um, um, uh, you know, without looking at the um, uh, without looking at the um, uh, at the impact on learners in the classroom, um, the perception in the classroom, and we will see in a minute that w there are certain obvious consequences um, to dyslexia in the classroom if discovered and not treated. But anyway, I think now we've got a fair idea of what signs we should look for to um, to analyze if a person is dyslexic or not. So let me summarize them: reading and writing slower than usual. Um, Spelling is not the best, it's not consistent, and obviously there are certain uh, issues with um, certain letters like B and D, um, and then the confusion, conf there's com some confusion in the order of the letters in the words, and then uh, to uh, the second group of, um, of symptoms is related to the organization and their ability to follow instructions. So these are really the seven main symptoms in dyslexia. There are other symptoms, but of course, these are the, the most common ones. Now, for us, 
um, we do have a, a large set of tests that can be used to provide accurate readings. And most of these accurate readings need to be very careful uh, because in many occasions um, um, a language barrier could impede the accuracy of our testing. So obviously a dyslexia test should be done in the same language of the mother tongue of the learner. So if I'm assessing if a person is dyslexic in Russian, I should do the test in Russian. Because obviously I don't want to risk it um, that basically the results are not um, accurate because of a language barrier. And there are lots of tools that basically, um, 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 you know, are, are there to to ensure that uh, learners are, um, you know, are screened properly. Um, uh, I worked on um, developing a set of questions that are typically asked to learners with um, a good level um, uh, of accuracy. Now, these tools are for the, for, I'm, I'm sure that basically many people would ask, where can we find these tools? Um, I mean, the British Dyslexia Association, the British Dyslexia Association provides a large set of tools. Uh, if you visit the British, the British Dyslexia Association, you'll find a section called screening. And it's a free online test. Um, a free online test um, that's available uh, to everybody to take. Um, um, there's the International Dyslexia Association as well uh, that provides some screening tools. Um, now, uh, of course, we can recommend uh, some, uh, we can share some links after this webinar uh, for you to use. Um, I mean, we can liaise with Yuli afterwards and I can make some links available afterwards. Um, but the, the, the idea is obviously you don't necessarily need to have um, a professional uh, diagnostic tool. I mean, it could be, uh, you know, for, uh, for an early uh, screening technique, every teacher could be a screening um, 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 a tool for the learners uh, because there are certain obvious uh, symptoms. However, of course, if you uh, have um, a learner in your class that's dyslexic, uh, my recommendation, of course, is to be referred to a specialist. And I'm sure in each country, um, 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 you know, there are uh, many specialists in this area. Um, uh, but obviously, I would be able to provide, um, you know, some uh, guidance on the tools that are available afterwards, after this webinar, by email, if you like. Um, one of the common things that um, um, that um, worries us, uh, really, in dyslexia, uh, is the fact that um, it's very much associated with um, uh, other, um, um, you know, issues. Uh, and the most common uh, the most common uh, uh, consequence of dyslexia uh, in, in young learners in particular is stress, stress and, and, and anxiety. And in some cases, um, uh, in some cases, um, um, it is an issue um, that's related to, um, uh, that leads to depression. You see, the question that I see on the side from Tatiana is asking me why is dyslexia a problem, although, um, um, you know, the video showed that it's, um, it, it leads to some, 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 some great achievers are dyslexic. Now, the, um, the point that I started the discussion with, that basically dyslexic learners can achieve great things, however, only, they can do that only with the right support. Lots of people, lots of school children have lower grade point average in many schools due to, dyslex due to dyslexia. So dyslexia can impede learning if not discovered. You know what I mean? So Tatiana, I hope that basically I made this point clear at the very beginning that um, although um, uh, dyslexic learners don't necessarily lack uh, the desire to learn or IQ, however, they do have um, uh, you know, certain, especially the severe forms of dyslexia, require formal specialist intervention. And if this intervention is not available, then that can imp impede learning and the development of learners. And that's why it's so critical, it's so critical to um, manage um, our learners and obviously uh, understand their needs. And I always say that the, the bottom line, the bottom line of all the, the work that we do at Cambridge or any other awarding body is really to be close to the learners, to be able to understand the needs of our learners. 
And if we are able to do that, then whether it's dyslexia or any other form of learning difficulty can be sorted. And we can transform uh, that disability into advantages. Um, but um, one of the consequences of why we should intervene early is exactly what I have shown in those slides, is that dyslexia um, can be very embarrassing uh, if it uh, goes untreated. And it's some, in some cases, in many cases, it leads to anxiety, it leads to stress, and in many cases it leads to, or in some cases it leads to depression, clinical depression that is. Um, you know what I mean? So uh, we need to be very, very careful. Um, and I mean, obviously, I worked in different parts of the world, and obviously, different parts of the world look at dyslexia in different eyes. So there's some cultural um, 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 there are some cultural barriers as well to dyslexia. So there is some sort of a stigma associated with it. So that's why it's important to talk about it, and, some, and it's important to see what interventions we have in place for it. But before we go into the invention tools, it's very important, really, to, um, to look at some of the realities and some of the myths around dyslexia. Um, now, um, uh, the, one of the most common things that I heard in the past is that dyslexia or pupils with dyslexia um, see words backwards, and that's not true at all. They don't necessarily see backwards, but they obviously have uh, issues with the spelling. Um, However, uh, a reality would be that a, a risk of dyslexia can be, um, uh, can be run in families, um, and that's, uh, that's, um, that's a fact. Um, so the first question that we ask our parents um, uh, uh, when they basically apply to a specific program uh, is the history of their, um, of their families, the medical history. Um, Another common thing that I uh, faced in various encounters uh, is the fact that um, um, that dyslexia, uh, dyslexic uh, difficulties uh, are more common in left-handers, and of course that's not true. There is no correlation between the two. Um, and the um, the other important point that I want to emphasize here uh, is um, uh, is uh, it basically it it runs in all ethnic groups. Now, in the short time that's left for us, um, I would like to share some of the strategies, some of the tips, and some of the tools um, that uh, I hope you will find quite useful. Uh, but I'm trying to answer as many questions as we go along. Um, um, so the question from Anna about um, uh, children with dyslexia have to study um, with others or in special groups. Now, there has been a number of experiments on, this, uh, on these two models, whether we should separate them or whether we should basically include them. And we will see in my next slide that one of the main things that basically we focus on is inclusivity. Um, we don't want a learner to feel excluded. I want to make sure that the learners are all um, subject to the same um, to the same learning outcomes, to the same materials, to the same support. And my role, really, is to make sure that, um, uh, that, um, 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 that our learners are understood, the needs of our learners are understood in a clear framework. Um, and, you know, and obviously we always focus on inclusive assessment as the tools uh, that we use for effective learning. So what's inclusive assessment? And I'm so sorry, I'm trying to breeze through the slides because uh, time is limited. We don't really have much time. Um, and um, well, we have plenty of information to talk about. Um, so inclusivity in general is the ability to respond to the needs of our learners all at once. So I'm able to respond to all the needs of my learners um, at the same, um, you know, in the same classroom. So I know that student A, student B, student C, D, etc., uh, you know, what their weaknesses and what their strengths are, and I'm able to address them. So that's what inclusivity refers to, and that's what we are trying to do. Historically, we had various forms of things that we um, um, were considering. So one of the main things that basically were presented uh, to learners in the past is what we call the contingency plan, which is special arrangement, such as giving extra time or putting them in a separate room. But this leads to a specific negative feeling in learners. And that's why it was developed uh, later to what they called the alternative approach. And the alternative approach is to provide learners with different set of exam questions, for example. Um, you know, but today, what we are calling for in Cambridge is an inclusive approach. 
an inclusive approach by which we are able to, re to respond and assess the same learning outcomes in different ways. So that means we are able to ask or measure or assess the, 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 the achievement or the, how much knowledge is retained in various ways. Various ways that are flexible enough that are able to respond to the needs of our learners. How can we do that? Um, there are certain forms. I divided these strategies in three groups. Some of these groups um, refer to the use of the materials, what materials we give to our learners. Some of them refer to the performance of the learner, and some of them refer to the teacher. So I will share with you some of these tips before we wrap things up. So that's the first set of tools. The first set of tools is related to the materials that we give to our learners. What kind of materials we give to our learners and how should we break our learners, uh, sorry, our materials to be effective and respond to the needs of all our learners in the classroom. So you see here, I'm not saying I'm not saying that we should give them separate sets of instructions. What I'm saying is obviously we are given specific types of tools or materials that are clear, that are able to um, um, uh, speak with each learner regardless of their difficulties or learning difficulties. So my advice would be the following. First of all, clarify or simplify written directions. That's the first point. So I would basically give the same instructions but in a clear way. The second one, the second one is present a small amount of work. That technically means I'm able to share um, um, the same amount of work, um, um, uh, but obviously in smaller chunks. Uh, distraction could be an issue, particularly for dyslexic learners. So if I'm uh, able to eliminate all um, external um, uh, distractions and um, uh, stimuli, then obviously um, I would increase their attention span. Um, highlight essential information. Highlight them. And then um, help the learners um, with more and effective exercises. Use audio recording instead of written pieces. So if somebody is struggling with reading, um, a placeholder, uh, Daria, is um, uh, what you can provide or what you can highlight in a calendar or on a paper. You know, so that's basically where uh, you need to uh, work around. So in the calendar, for example, a placeholder is when you block a certain hour. Um, you know, something like this. Um, um, or, um, you know, in a classroom, in a physical classroom, when you put, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, instructions in, in, in a specific format, in a specific uh, context. Um, and then use audio resources. Uh, and most importantly, and interestingly, uh, to use assistive technology. That's really, really crucial. And then the second set of tools is to, um, that basically these are the instructions that are related to the teachers. So as teachers now, not the materials, the materials we know it, we, we are able to see some advice, but for teachers, uh, provide students with a graphic organizer, um, maintain daily routines, um, repeat directions, and repeat, 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 provide reviews, enforce, and reinforce. And the last part is focus on the learner's performance change the response mode. I don't want you to write a test for me. I don't want you to write an essay. Use a presentation. Talk about it. Um, um, in, there are certain techniques that will increase attention, like basically using blue paper in, um, instead of white, for example. Um, using vertical lines for maths instead of um, uh, horizontal. Um, um, and um, using uh, flexible times instead of set times and then providing additional practice. Um, so these are really um, uh, some tips and some um, pieces of advice. And now I'm so sorry for um, the limited time that we had.
Um, I think the presentation before me uh, took much longer, and I have another call in around five minutes. Um, and obviously, that brings us to the end of my presentation. But what I'm going to do uh, to uh, support all our teachers uh, that are listening to me today, um, I will be working with Yulia on providing some uh, resources and some tools. Uh, and um, um, in, in any way, you have my email address and you have my WhatsApp number. I would be more than happy to support as much as I can. That brings me to the end of this brief webinar. Uh, I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I look forward to um, seeing you soon. Thank you very much once again, and take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. That was really great. Thank you. I'm terribly sorry for these technical issues. Sometimes we have some problems with technologies. So, uh, internet connection and um, these platforms, they are so new for us. So, fingers crossed, very soon we will be able to um, get back to our normal life. And um, we will be happy to see all of you at our offline real, physical, face-to-face -face events. So now I'm happy to introduce um, Artem Morozov. Uh, Artem is a CELTA certified teacher, influencer, uh, and uh, well, I'm absolutely sure that uh, you know him. So Artem, I hope you can hear me well. I can see you perfectly. uh if you can hear me well please um let me know in the comment section uh put a plus or something yeah okay great i'm happy to see you guys i'm very pleased uh, to be your guest uh yeah i saw a lot of pluses in the comment section this is great okay great we can start then so um uh my name is artyom and i teach in st petersburg where in the world do you teach? Please tell me in the comment section. Where do you work? Uh, what's the name of your city? Moscow. Okay. Moscow, St. Petersburg too. Hello, guys. Kazan. All right. So many people. Belarus. <laughs> Hello, friends. Well, I work in St. Petersburg, but most of my students do not live in St. Petersburg. How is that possible? Well, uh, about three years ago, I made a very important decision. I decided to go online with all my groups and all my students. And at that time, when I decided to do that, uh, well, this was me. <laughs> this was me when I started to teach online. Well, I was scared, Steve. Uh, I bet you felt something like this uh, a month ago when we were forced to go online with all our students. Uh, I felt exactly the same, but I had to do that because this was probably the only way to to do what I love, which is uh, teaching young learners. Uh, now I do a lot of teacher training uh, here in Russia, and I have to travel a lot, and this was probably the only way to make it possible. So this was me, and I was scared. I didn't know what to do. What's the best platform? Uh, how can I teach? There were no uh, course books, no handbooks for teachers. No platforms, no resources, nothing actually. Uh, and uh, the only thing uh, I could use was uh, a Skype or Zoom. Uh, and I would have to say that this is probably the only thing you need. Which, this is you, <laughs> your laptop with a camera and some kind of messenger like uh, Zoom or Skype. If you are choosing between these two, uh, Zoom or Skype, which one is better? I would say that uh, Skype is probably better if you teach uh, individual students or pairs. If you work with groups, it is wiser to take a look at Zoom. It's better for group student, for group, uh, for groups, for online groups. But you will have to pay for it. Uh, Skype is free. Uh, of course, you can use PowerPoint to create uh, interactive games and everything. I share a lot of games on my blog, and I, I'm sure you've downloaded some of them. Um, but you don't have to create them all yourself. There are uh, very useful resources like WordWall or uh, Quizlet where you can create your interactive games um, 
they're very user friendly. It's very easy to understand how they work. And well, you can basically use these resources instead of uh, trying to uh, understand how PowerPoint works. Well, uh, and of course, you can use Miro. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a board, it's an online board. This is a substitute for your traditional offline uh, board. You can draw on it, you can add pictures on it. You can do tons of things. Um, you might also consider using uh, Google Docs. So for, for instance, you could create a presentation in Google Slides instead of, instead of uh, using PowerPoint, and then your students would be able to interact with it. And of course, you can use the applications that were developed by Cambridge Assessment. If you look, um, uh, it, it, uh, there is a QR code. You can scan it with your phone, and you'll go to the page where you will see all the applications available. They are free. They are pretty good. Uh, the students like them, and you can use them as your uh, homework assignment, for instance. If you use Okay, people from London are watching now. <laughs> okay, if you use any of these resources, give me a plus or something in, in the comment section. But I would say that uh, this is all too much for the first lesson. If you are starting, yeah, I see a lot of pluses. So people use most of these things. You don't have to, to use them all at once. Well, this is because we do not teach passive voice or future perfect continuous to our elementary students, right? Why? Well, because it's too much. <laughs> at first, you would want to keep it simple, as simple as it is possible. So. Uh, if if this is your first uh, time, if you if if it's the first time you you teach online, if it's the first month you teach online, I would still keep it as simple as this possible. All of these platforms, PowerPoint and everything, will be later when you feel confident. This is probably for intermediate and advanced users. Uh, but at first, the only thing you really need is your laptop, the camera, and uh, a bunch of flashcards. Uh, some props you use in your usual lessons and probably um, your headphones. That's it. That's that's all you need, really. So uh, everything, everything can be done without sophisticated technology. For instance, I'll just use my phone, and this is what we usually do when we start a lesson. We uh, started with a hello song, and we'll sing it right now. Hello, friends. How are you? I'm very happy to see you. Greet your neighbor, boogie on down. He will jump and turn around. Well, and so on, we, we go ahead. So you can basically just use your phone, turn on the music, you dance, and the kids will copy what you are doing. And this is very simple, right? You don't have to be a computer genius to do this. Uh, this is a song by Dr. Gene. You can find it on YouTube, but I'll, I'll send it to you later uh, with the materials. I hope Yulia will help me <laughs> with that. Of course, you can use all the flashcards, uh, all the flashcards you usually use in your uh, traditional uh, classroom. For instance, um, well, what games can you play? Well, my favorite, let's, let's, well, horse, horse, horse. Okay, a horse, a horse, a horse, a horse, a horse, and the kids repeat, a horse, a horse. A horse, a horse, a horse. Or say it like a monster, a horse! And the kids, a horse. Say it like a princess, a horse, a horse. Or say it like a snake, a horse, a horse. Or say it like a goat, a horse, a horse. And they repeat this. Or say it quiet and then loud, 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 and very loud. A horse, a horse, a horse, and they scream at me. This is very 
Uh, very funny. Well, um, clap and stomp. When you show a card, you intentionally make mistakes. For example, I say, oh, it's a bad. It's a bad. And the students, yes, yes, it's a bad. And they clap. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. But then I intentionally make a mistake. And this is a sofa. And they're like, no, 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 no. And they stomp with their feet. Or they can even uh, bang on the table to make loud noises. They like it. But be careful if the computer is standing on the table. It can be dangerous for the computer and for the kids. Or um, slow card, fast card. Well, let's play. OK, let's play. Let's try. What is this? <laughs> What is this? Can you tell me in the comment section what's that? Hmm. Hmm. What is this? A car! Yes, Tatiana, excellent. Anastasia, yes, it's a car. No, it's not a bus, it's a car. Do, 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 do. Excellent, very well done. Great job, yay! <laughs> okay, now slow card, okay? It will be a slow, very slow card. What is this? What is this? Can you tell me in the comment section? Yay, it's a t-shirt. Congratulations. Yay. It's a t-shirt. That's right. Correct. So, uh, slow, fast, big or small. You can show the flashcard very close. Let's try. So, you show the flashcard, but it's very big and the students cannot see the whole picture. But can you guess what it is? Hmm, what, who is that? Yes, yes, it's, it's a giraffe. Congratulations, yay. <laughs> giraffe, this is a giraffe. Hello, giraffe. Hello, giraffe. Hello, giraffe. Hello, giraffe. Okay, or you can place this flashcard somewhere at the background very far from the camera where the students cannot see it clearly and they'll be able to, to play with it so you'll be able to play with it they'll be guessing what is under my sofa what is on the cupboards in my room if you see the room behind me well all right what else do we have in the in, in our phone of course we have got this a flashlight and you can use a flashlight to play with your flashcards so, for instance, look, can you see anything? If you cannot see anything, can you draw a minus in the, in the comment section? Uh, right, a minus. Okay, nothing, nothing. You cannot see anything. Okay. Well, but what about now? What can you see now? Mm, what is this? Mm, magic. <laughs> it's a book. <laughs> so, what I do, I just um, play with my flashlight. You can show a piece of the picture. Uh, very good for practicing present continuous if there are a lot of people and animals in the picture. You can see different parts of the picture and the students will be trying to guess what people or animals are doing in the picture. All right, you can, you can use the, the pictures from, uh, from sample papers for uh, YLE uh, exams. Uh, one more game I love is Mr. Wolf. It's my favorite uh, offline game, Mr. Wolf. But I play this game online too, but uh, a little bit differently. Pick a card with a dangerous animal. Well, what dangerous animals do you know? Mm, what should be our dangerous animal? A cat is not dangerous, right? So what should it be? Huh. Okay, what about this one? Ah, ah, who is that? <laughs> oh, crocodile. No, it's not a shark. Yay, shark. So you take a shark and you take other animals like uh, cats and uh, parrot and so on. And you hide a shark between the flashcards. What do your students do? You show the picture. And the students say what it is. So they would say, it's a parrot. And they say together, it's a parrot. You may want to choose uh, another chank. For example, 
uh, and other chunk. For example, uh, I like parrots or I can see a parrot or I have got a parrot. Okay, so they say this, I have got a parrot. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I have got a giraffe or I can see a giraffe. Okay. <laughs> ah! Shark, shark, shark. And everybody hides under the table. This is a lot of fun. And we play this, uh, we, you can play until they're bored. Miming, ex, uh, miming things, everything. Uh, for example, what animal is this? Meow, 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 meow. Who's that? A cat, yay, excellent, very well done, correct. <laughs> it's a cat, yay. Great job. Well. You can do this, right? But if you want to combine uh, miming with um, an action minute, because, well, yes, it's an online lesson, but still all the routines should be the same. You still need to make your students move. They should stand up. They should do things uh, you usually do in the classroom. So you can play fun and freeze. Uh, how do you play this? Uh, you ask your students to stand up, you turn on some funny music, like, I don't know, <laughs> some funny music, and they start running around the room, uh, around their room, obviously, and then you stop the music and they freeze, uh, trying to imitate some kind of animal or object, it can be a means of transport, food, whatever, it can be anything. Uh, and uh, the the boss eat yeah the student who is eat is trying to guess uh, what his uh, classmates are uh, imitating what they are miming what 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 is this okay and they 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 play like this and then the next student is eat yeah you can do that right it's easy and a lot of fun and you don't you don't need to be a computer genius to do all this you just need a camera and flashcards um there are many things you can do uh with the props well i have a lot of uh props i used in my uh offline classroom bread right uh cheese uh, you can use them in your online lessons. For example, you can use them instead of flashcards. Uh, but you can also play. You can play. You can play with props. You can play with uh, toy food. Um, well, the first game I wanted to share today doesn't really need any anything. It, it, you don't need to. You, you need just your hands. Um, and you, you, I usually start my lessons with this game. I start making noises like this, scratching noises. We have checked our homework, and then somebody starts scratching. Masha, are you scratching? Hmm? Masha, you are scratching. And Masha is, mm -mm, mm -mm. I am not scratching. I'm not scratching. I'm not scratching, says Masha. Mm, who's scratching? Mm? Of course, Sereja, you are scratching. Sereja is, oh no, no, I'm not scratching. <laughs> Who is scratching? And then kids usually join in and they start to scratch their tables and play too. Well, uh, ultimately, we uh, understand that the monster was scratching. Ooh, this is Mr. Chocolate. Uh, this is my favorite friend because he, I like chocolate, and he's Mr. Chocolate. Oh, and he comes and he asks uh, questions. Uh, he asks each kid, um, what is your name? Ooh, hello. Ooh, and what is your name? <laughs> In Zoom, you can uh, uh, make the, uh, the, the image from the child's camera bigger, and this is a kind of a way to invite the student uh, to the board. So you, you may play with, 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 with this function a little bit. But you don't have to do that, really. 
So, Mr. Monster, <laughs> has come, and this monster is. Look, look uh, let's ask Mr. Monster how he is today. Mr. Monster, are you happy today? Are you happy, Mr. Monster? No, I'm not happy. Okay, uh, are you sad? <laughs> yes, I'm very sad. <laughs> why is he sad? Why do you? Why do you think? Uh, he is sad. Why do you think he's sad? Oh, he's hungry. No, he's not hungry. No, I'm not hungry. I have just eaten my lunch. He's dirty? No, it's not dirty. Are you dirty? No, no, no. I'm not dirty. Mm, thirsty? No, I'm not thirsty. No, no, no. Well, he has got a problem with his ear. <laughs> my ear? Oh, oh, my ear hurts. His ear, ow, 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 his ear hurts. So, and we'll be doctors, well, I'll be the doctor, and they'll be my assistants. They'll be telling me what to do with the monster to help the monster. For example, um, I've got this um, syringe. <laughs> we'll unpack it, and of course, I'll not need the needle. I'll just throw it away. But I can use the syringe to give him an injection, to give him an injection into his ear, in his mouth, <laughs> in his nose, everywhere. And this is a, a way to study the uh, uh, body parts with kids. They love giving instructions. If they have their own toys, they can use during the lesson, they can be doctors too. And then we will give them instructions what to do with their toys. And they can give them injections with a pen. Or they can use uh, scotch tape to um, bandage their legs or ears or nose, whatever they want to bandage. Um, one more story we use uh, is uh, this uh, Mr. Naughty Mr. Mar uh, who was scratching. This was the marker. The marker was scratching. Okay, hello, marker. Hello, marker. What's your name? My name is Mr. Black. Oh, hello, Mr. Black. Hello, Mr. Black. All right, what should I do? What should I do with Mr. Maka? Hmm, what should I do? Hmm, maybe I should eat Mr. Maka. Huh? Uh? And the kids are saying, no, 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 Artyom, don't eat, don't eat the maca. So I, I will insist on their saying this, don't eat the maca. Okay, well, what should I do? Maybe I should throw it away, throw it away. And they will say, oh, they usually don't say anything. They just uh, shake their hands. And I'll insist on their saying this, don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. Okay, what should I do? Maybe I should take off, take off the lead, take off the lead. And they say, yes, yes, yes. And I'll insist, take off the lead, Artyom. Take off the lead. And they will say, take off the lead. Okay, and now take off the lead. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Oh, marker! Oh no! Look, my my finger, my finger is dirty. <laughs> marker, and they will say, "Oh, Artyom, your finger is dirty." Yeah. Oh, oh no! Look, my my palm, my palm. <laughs> My palm is dirty. And the kids will say, oh, Artyom, your palm is dirty. And then my nose will be dirty. My ears will be dirty and everything. And this is a really naughty maca. But uh, choose a maca that you can clean uh, <laughs> easily. So because uh, now we're going to wash Artyom. <laughs> now we're going to wash Artyom. And I'll use, um, I just bought these sponges. I, um, they're very cheap and they're of different colors so I can use uh, I can speak I can choose the color first so I'm dirty okay so let's wash let's wash me <laughs> can you help me and they yes yes of course let's wash Artyom yes let's wash Artyom okay so um, we need a sponge right we need a sponge what color do you like an orange sponge, a 
yellow sponge, a green sponge, a blue sponge, and they choose the color. For example, they they decided to choose the red sponge or uh, pink, a pink sponge. Okay, so look. Oh, and they say, Artyom, wash your finger, wash your finger, and I'll I'll start washing. I wash, 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 wash. But look, I can't, I can't wash my finger. I can't wash my finger. What should I do? Uh, it's because the sponge is not wet. I need some water. And they will say, Artyom, we need some water. Okay, look, I have got some water. Hey, <laughs> woohoo, yay. Psst, 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 psst. Um, Artyom, spray some water on the sponge. Spray some water on the sponge. Okay. Is it enough? And they'll say, no, no. More, more, more water, please. More water, please. And they will repeat after me. More water, please. Okay. Okay. More? And they'll say, more, more. More? Yes, more. Okay. That's enough. <laughs> At some point, it should be enough. And then uh, they'll give me instructions. So the kids give me instructions and I basically do what they say. Wash your finger. All right. I'm washing, 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 washing my finger. Yay. Oh, look. It's clean now. It's clean. Clean finger. And so on. Clean your nose. Clean your um, mouth. <laughs> Whatever is dirty. Yeah. Some children can even um, try to uh, use their markers to draw on their faces. So you should be ready for that. Um, so this silly marker, uh, wash it with a sponge um, and so on. A lot of different activities you can do with your props. Uh, uh, Natalia is saying that little children can't say so many phrases. They can. They can try. Try. Trust me, they can. If you give them an example, if you set this, if you give them the ready-made phrase, which they can repeat after you, they can, they can do much more than we expect, usually. So, Props. What can we do with the props? Uh, using different objects in the room where the student is. Uh, there are a lot of materials we can use. For example, the window. The window. Uh, can your students guess what the weather is like in uh, my... Can you guess what the weather is like in my city? What's the weather like in St. Petersburg? What do you think? Hmm. Well... What's the weather like? What do you think? <laughs> it's rainy. Yeah, it's usually raining in St. Petersburg, but today it's not so rainy. It's a little bit uh, windy. Yes, it's a little bit cloudy. It's a little bit cold. Yay, good job. Great job. And then I will guess about my students, what the weather is like in my students' city. If I've got several students, they will guess what the weather is like in uh, their classmates' cities. Touch the sofa, touch the table, touch the cupboard, touch the door. So we all stand up and I give them instructions and they run to different objects in, the, in, the, in their room and touch. Uh, run to the table, run to the window, <laughs> fly to the window, okay? Jump, jump to the window, jump to the table and so on. And then they will give us instructions. So some, they will be uh, bosses in turns. Uh, uh, hide the toy. You can take, this is my friend, Mr. Mouse. Hello, hello. So what I will do, I will just hide Mr. Mouse somewhere at the background in my room and they will be uh, trying to find it. So I will say, sleep. And they will, they will sleep, they will pretend that they are sleeping. And I'll hide Mr. Mouse somewhere under the bed, uh, in the cupboard, somewhere where they can see him, but it's not easy to find. So they will need to look at my flat and try to find Mr. Mouse where he is. And then they will hide their toy. This is very good for uh, prepositions. There is, there isn't, yeah. Uh, it's especially good if you prepare your students for uh, starters. Uh, there is a, 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 a the, the in, in speaking part, in the speaking part of the examination, 
they will be asked to put different objects in on different places in the picture so you can actually do the same in the room for example you could say okay take your toy take the mouse and put it on the table and everybody is going to the table and uh, putting the take uh, the mouse on the table now take the mouse and put it under the window or on the cupboard and so on what is missing they sleep 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 everybody's sleeping and then i steal one of the objects uh for example i if i if we study food i will take one food item from the back and they will be trying to remember what is missing or I could steal the pillow from my bed and they will be trying to remember what's missing they will say oh okay the pillow is missing yeah anything anything can be done if you study furniture um, you can use flashcards so what I do uh, I take a random flashcard with a piece of furniture okay this is a bed and I'll ask my students what do you think where where is where is uh, the bed in my flat where is the bed what do you think by the way where is the flat where is the bed in my flat where is it hmm i don't know what, what do you think is it in the kitchen is it in the bathroom yes in the bedroom great job yay <laughs> correct this is correct in the bedroom well but it's not so obvious where my washing machine is where is my washing machine what do you think yeah if you know don't say in the kitchen in the bathroom uh, no it's not in the kitchen no it's not in the bathroom uh, yes it's in the hall yay correct great job in the hall it's in the hall so my washing machine is in the hall this is strange I know well it's uh, actually not in the hall it's in the cupboards in the hall this is very strange I know but they can play the same game so they will ask you questions where is where is my sofa hmm. where is my cupboard and, they would, and everybody else will try to guess where this cupboard is or you can actually uh, play spot the differences game this is very important to do this exercise if you prepare your students for movers or flyers uh, spot the differences between my room and my students room what is the difference well for example uh, in my room the walls are green but in your room the walls are white okay he says well uh, there is a sofa in my room but there isn't a sofa in your room so and so on uh, until somebody doesn't know what to say and this person is a loser you can do the same if you work with a group of students they will be trying to find the differences between their room and their classmates rooms using family members is a great idea for example uh, well look at this picture uh, who do you think it is how old is this mm, person <laughs> it's not coronavirus <laughs> no <laughs> It's a baby, five, no, 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 it's cold, 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 cold. <laughs> 20, no, very cold, two, hot, 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 three, um, not so, one, yes, <laughs> it's a baby and the baby is one year old. And then who is this in my family? Who is that? What do you think? <laughs> so you can, you know, remember there was a, a game, a very popular quiz show where they uh, showed you just the eyes of a famous person and then everybody needed to guess who this famous person is. Well, you can ask parents to send you the uh, photos of their family members and you will just cut the eyes and the students will be guessing who this is in uh, uh, their classmates family yeah <laughs> okay well uh yeah it's my uh, my sister's my sister's daughter my sister's daughter okay great well uh, who, uh tanya 
Tanya is from my family. Who is she? What do you think? Tanya. Who is Tanya? Hmm. Is she your sister? Is she your... No, she's not my wife. No, she's not. Is she... No, she's not my sister. Sorry, no. She's not my niece. No, 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 no. Yes, she's my mom. Great job. Correct. Yay. <laughs> well, uh, and then the student will ask everybody, who is Vadim or who is Maxim? Who is Joan? Who is Sam uh, in my family? How old is my mom? Can you guess? Is she 46? Is she 90? Is she... And so on. And you will say hot, hot, or no, cold, cold, warm. <laughs> 52. <laughs> cold, cold. <laughs> cold, very cold. <laughs> well, uh, until they finally get the age of this person. What is my mom doing? What is she doing now? Well, can you guess what she is doing now? Is she sleeping? <sighs> Is she cooking? Is she watching TV? Okay, uh, Valentina is saying, she, saying she's cooking. No, she's not cooking. Sorry, she's not cooking. Mm, what is she doing? Uh, okay. She's watching this webinar. No. <laughs> she's cleaning. She's working. She's reading. Yes, Valentina. Correct. Great job. Yes, she's uh, <laughs> reading. Yes. Uh, and then the student will do the same. He will ask, what is my cat doing? And then it's uh, a lot of fun if your students are using uh, phones or tablets to uh, study English. They can then stand up and go to the cat and show the cat, the actual cat, like uh, to prove <laughs> what the cat is doing. And the cat will be very surprised. <laughs> Whose phone is this? Um, consult the parents before you uh, decide to do this exercise but you can uh, take different objects uh, like a phone or a pen uh, or a credit card <laughs> a wallet I don't know a dress a skirt uh, and you show this to your students and you ask your students whose for example whose pen is this what do you think whose pen is this hmm. whose is it my grandfather's pen? Is it my grandmother's pen? <laughs> it's impossible. Well, it is possible. Well, yeah, the main point here is to uh, make them drill this grammar. So it's probably a little bit sneaky, but anyways, it works well. My cats, no. <laughs> Nadezhda is saying that it's my, it's mine, <laughs> yours. Yeah, this is my pen actually. Yeah, this is not interesting. But I could use the objects of uh, which belong to different family members like my sister's phone my sister's uh, dress and they and then the students do the same they show us something and we'll try to guess whose it is so a lot a lot can be done you can even use your hands uh, you don't really need even props just use your hands uh, uh, right now, we are participating in a very uh, interesting uh, 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 ELT game for teachers, which is called Mitatriad. And uh, one of the participants, Yelena Naumchik, uh, shared this idea with us. Uh, it's called Catch the Dolphin. And I loved it. I tried it like five or six times, and all my kids loved it. Uh, when I feel that they are tired and we need an action minute, we can play catch the dolphin. The dolphin is very shy. He's, this is dolphin. Ooh, I'm very shy. He's very shy. And we are photographers, we are journalists. We'll need to take a picture, take a photo of the dolphin like this. So this will be like a flashlight <laughs> uh, uh, of the camera. It will be the camera. So, and the dolphin will be jumping in front of my camera and they'll be trying to catch it with uh with a clap if somebody managed to catch the dolphin he will be the next uh, boss it's quite difficult you can try um how am i how am i for example how am i today well can you guess can you guess how i am today i i can i can still read <laughs> so you know, third yes 
I'm sad. <laughs> and, and now, I'm sleepy. <laughs> no, I'm not sleepy. Fine. Yeah, okay, now I'm fine. Now I'm fine. So, and uh, you see, you hide your, you, um, you imitate some emotion, and then you hide your face in your palms. And the kids will be trying to guess how you are. And then they will do the same. This is a lot of fun. Uh, rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, they will point with their <laughs> hands at the camera. Rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three. Okay, I've got scissors, but Serioja has got uh, the rock and he is the winner. It means that he can ask the question with uh, a word on the flashcard. Um, finger plays. Um, baby shark, wheels on the bus, everything else can be done online easily. You just play the music on your phone and the kids will repeat, they will copy your, they will copy your actions. All right, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities to praise your kids. Well, who said that you cannot give your kids stickers if you teach your kids online? You can give stickers in the chat, uh, in Skype, or uh, in Zoom. You have got this uh, function. You can send a sticker to your students. and You, you can even uh, choose one uh, personalized sticker for every student. And then if somebody does something good, you turn on this music, like, uh, like this, right? And you give this person a smiley in the chat, like I'll do right now. Yay, this is a great job. You, <laughs> this smiley is <laughs> to you guys. Uh, you can also use uh, the uh, stickers uh, like this. Yeah, these are just uh, sticks and um, stickers, cheap stickers I bought in a supermarket. You can use flowers. Um, I bought some plastic flowers and if the student did something great, I really want to reward the student, I would turn on the music and, oh yes, look, oh, wow, what is this? It's a flower. Do you want to smell the flower? And the student will smell it through the camera. Mmm, mmm, wow, great. Ah, smells good, and the student will say, smells good, excellent, and then you will uh, put this flower into, uh, into a vase, or I've got this um, magic tree, so I'll just put this flower into it, and at the end of the lesson, we will count how many flowers my student got. This was, this was for girls. Well, for boys, I've got a, a football, this one, I... Um, <laughs> drew this picture myself, but you can you can find a sticker or print it somewhere. So this is a football, and if my student did something good and I want to reward him, I would play this music and yes, wow, great job! <gasps> what what is this? It's a it's a ball. It's a ball. Can you can you kick can you kick the ball? And uh, my student will. Uh, pretend to kick the ball into the camera like this. So, come on, kick the ball, kick the ball. And then I'll stick it to the magnet board that is behind my back. Or um, put it somewhere on display where he will be able to see. And then at the end of the lesson, we will count the footballs he managed to earn. And of course, high five. You can give high five <laughs> like this. Okay, great job, great job, very well done. Yes, very well done. High five, high five. And because of this funny effect uh, of the camera, it's trying to focus on my hands and the picture gets a little blurred. And this, uh, this is kind of cool. Kids like to do this, this online high five. And they all do this at the same time. So, uh, can you give me, <laughs> can you <laughs> high five please everybody? Okay, right now, come on in your cameras. <laughs> well, I cannot see your eyes, I cannot shake your hands. This is so sad. But uh, thanks to this crisis, thanks to this coronavirus uh, problem, we've learned so much. And um, I hope that we'll go back to normal very soon. I really enjoyed being your guest. 
thank you so much. Uh, you are great, guys. You're a great audience. Thank you so much. Uh, see you soon. Have a good day. Dear friends, I hope you can hear me well. So that was the final presentation of our online conference, Teaching and Assessing Young Learners. Thank you very much for participation. We will share all the materials very soon. Thanks a lot to our wonderful presenters. Artyom, that was um, fantastic. So interactive. Thanks a lot. Okay, so here uh, on this slide, you can see contact details of Artyom. So if you have any questions about these fantastic ac activities, you can uh, send an email or join his uh, VK uh, group. Um, thank you, Artyom. Uh, that's it. So dear friends, uh, during this uh, difficult time, please uh, stay home, stay safe. And uh, fingers crossed, very soon we will be able to get back to normal. Sorry for some technical issues. Thank you for your understanding. Goodbye.